to a uh, roll call. Okay, Rodriguez? Present. Swift? Present. Green? Here. Fragoso? Here. Caroline? Here. Chair Newton? Here. Okay, and uh, next on our agenda is approval of our agenda. Uh, anyone like to make any changes to the agenda? Okay, hearing that, I take that as some sort of silent and unanimous motion to approve I, I the will, agenda. I will move approval of the agenda. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. Um, I'm going to read the meeting protocol. The chair shall maintain order at the meetings in accordance with Robert's rules of order. And the commission has the responsibility to be a model of respectful behavior in order to encourage community participation and citizen input at the commission meetings. The commission and the audience are expected to refrain from using profane language and or ridiculing the character or motive of the commission members, staff, or members of the public and to maintain the standards of tolerance and civility. And with that, if anyone is here who would like to comment on something that is not on the agenda, now is the opportunity to go up to the dais and do so. And I don't see anyone. So we are going to skip over the consent calendar. Uh, because we have no items on the consent calendar. And that takes us to our first public hearing item. And uh, Assistant Planner Levinson is uh, going to tell us about that. Thank you. Uh, the project site is 12,892 square feet in area. It's located at 103 Woodland Road. Um, it has an average slope of about 27%. It currently contains a 2,216-square-foot, three-story single-family residence. It's 24 feet in height. There's a typo there in the staff report. Um, the current residence contains three bedrooms and two bathrooms, a concrete parking pad, and decks. About 895 square feet of the first level contains um, essentially a basement um, and on the plans that's noted as having a bedroom and a bathroom but that that space has never been legalized by the town um, so the staff report contains some information about the background of um, the site um, in 2014 the previous owners rebuilt their foundation and received a building permit for that and in part of uh, the inspections for that project came to the town's attention that more work had been performed and that work constituted a 50% remodel. And um, the appropriate discretionary approvals were needed. The property was sold and the current owner is now going through that process here um, tonight. So the proposed project involves legalizing that first floor area, the 895 square feet, it would include one bedroom, one bathroom, um, storage, and a new landing. They propose to construct a new stairway that connects the first and second stories of the residence, um, expand decks on the second floor, and um, add uh, 256 square feet to that second floor. They propose on the third level to expand a bedroom and a bathroom by 173 square feet and construct a new 948 square foot um, rooftop terrace or deck off of that third bedroom. Um, in addition, a 250, 225 square foot carport is proposed over a portion of the existing parking pad and that previously contained a garage. So with the project, the total height of the residence would increase to 28 and a half feet, and it would increase in area to, to 3,540 square feet, and it would contain four bedrooms and three bathrooms. 
Um, the staff report contains a table of the setbacks and um, the carport replacing the garage um, with that carport would be located both in the front and the side setback. Um, therefore, a variance to the setback requirements is required from the planning commission to construct that carport. Um, the discretionary approvals that are needed by the planning commission are the um, Hill Area Residential Development Permit. The site is located in a landslide hazard zone and it's considered a set standard in size and that kicks it into that HRD requirement. As I discussed, variances are required to the um, front, the combined front and rear setback as well as the side combined side setback requirements. Um, a design review permit is required. Um, an encroachment permit is required because um, a portion of the carport and some other improvements um, existing and proposed are located within a town right of way. So the applicant is requesting an encroachment permit to construct and retain those improvements. The Ross Valley Fire Department has reviewed the project. They approved a vegetation management plan for the project on June 4th, 2018. I, I passed that out to you there. You have that approval. And they are requiring removal of a six inch in diameter pine tree with this project and removal of some, some bamboo as well. Um, also, in addition, I um, passed out to you some additional site photos and then um, something from the applicant that the architect's going to go into more detail about with regard to that third level tech. So at, at this point, I recommend that you conduct the public hearing and move to approve application 18-11 as amended by adopting resolution 2018-10. And I would like to note um, in addition to the resolution, and that is um, I realized that language about the tree removal permit wasn't included in the resolution. So on page six, I would like to add underneath item 12, a new item 13, with our standard language about obtaining the tree removal permit um, for any, any trees that are subject to the tree ordinance, which that pine tree would be subject to. to those requirements. Excuse me, Michelle, that's page six of the reso? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Gotcha. So, so I, I, I was hoping to add that under item 12. That would just be the new 13, and then I would change the numbering uh -huh. after that. Does anyone else have any questions for staff? Michelle. Oh. Michelle and then Phil. Hey Michelle, just um, I have two questions. One is you mentioned earlier there was a typo. I'm sorry, I missed your reference. Oh sure. There's actually two. Um, <laughs> so the first one is in the staff report under background in that second sentence. It's the maximum height is 24 feet of the residence, and then um, in the resolution on page three, at the top of the page under small a, it should be a roof top terrace, not a roof stop terrace. So does that mean that on uh, page three of the staff report under height required is 24? Right, so in that table on page three, those are the correct heights. The existing height is 24 feet and they're proposing oh. 28 feet. Oh, existing height is 24. Okay, I apologize. Yeah, it's a slash. It's a little bit confusing. Okay. Um, the other question I had had to do with page four of the staff report regarding um, just the variance. Um, that there had been, on the second paragraph there, there was something about a garage being there. And so 
has it been gone so long and can't be a non-conforming use that they can just rebuild then? It has to go through variance? Yes. Okay, thank you. Phil? Um, I noticed that there's a, a few times mentioned that this carport is, is part of what's causing the encroachment. And I was wondering if that was an optional thing that the owner wanted to have, or is it something we're requiring because of the ordinance? We are required because it's a 50% remodel, and they're also adding a bathroom to provide the three spaces one must be covered. That's a requirement of the code. And they're proposing to replace it in this place where there's been historical parking and this existing concrete pad. I'm sorry, through the chair, <clears throat> the requirement of the three parking spaces could be the bathroom, but also an additional bedroom, right? It's, it's the additional bedroom. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> you have a question? Uh, just a, a correction. So page two, page three, um, the staff report, first paragraph, the sixth line under Hill Area Residential Development Permit, I believe it should be the word life, not like. That's correct. Okay. okay, I have, uh, Two questions, I think, we'll see. Um, the first one is about the tree, and uh, that would require approval by our tree committee, uh, even if we are to approve this uh, project. Is that correct? That's correct. OK. Um, and then the other question is about accessory dwelling units and with the uh, new square footage um, state law would allow accessory dwelling unit uh, potentially of a certain size and I was wondering what that size would be. Is it at 10%? of the area of the residence or 1,200 square feet, whichever is small. As, as the ordinance right. currently, it is small. So um, that would be, at, it would be 1,200 square feet because 50% of the 3540 is 177. But clarifying that the definition of that type of a unit it includes what, a kitchenette or something, not just a bathroom or living area. I mean, excuse me, a bathroom and a room, a bedroom. So she, that would be the design does not equal to a second year. Right, that would be the full plumbing AG and um, parking, the additional parking would have to be provided because this is over a half a mile from public transit. And actually the applicant explored providing an ADU here, um, um, but the cost of providing that parking was, was, was not. Well, that is frustrating. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Sure. Through the, the chair, other. along the same lines, could it be a JDU? It could, but With it's... no additional cost. It, well, it's, it's slightly larger. Because I believe the, side, the max size of the junior is 500 square feet, and this is 895. So they would have to um, kind of be creative and, and, and kind of make that area smaller, the, the, that area that's dedicated to the junior second unit, and put in the other improvements, the sink, the counter. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for staff? And if not, then I will open the public hearing, and uh, I assume we have an applicant amongst us. And um, I'm going to first ask the council, uh, the commission, whether any of us are uh, have any questions for the applicants. Should we hear? Oh, please. 
stair doesn't connect and something was left undone by the last owner that, that just makes no logical sense apparently and and so this this to the owner this project is designed to really make this house livable right is that the, is that the part of the issue yeah it looks a little sad can you can turn the little light on hi my name is Stacy um, it looks a little sad um, and, and yeah, so I'm just I'm finishing what's there and bringing it all up to code. It's pretty. It was a, it was originally a cabin built in 1925, and then it was added on by I think um, I think there was probably one maybe two owners that just put put some pieces together, and then it became this house that just doesn't make any sense and doesn't need code. Okay. Thank you. Actually, I have one question for staff, I think. <clears throat> staff, is staff is proposing that instead of the large rooftop terrace, that it be limited to the 15 feet width for which we have the revised plans. Is that, uh, I didn't notice if that was in the reso, we could look at that later, I suppose, when we get to it. That's right. So um, that third rooftop deck, or the third deck of the bedroom, um, is new and would exceed 900 square feet. And um, just in talking to staff, mostly Linda, <laughs> with all her years of experience, and Mark, it's a very, very large deck. Um, one of the largest, I think, that's been proposed in town. I, I was wondering if that would be suitable for solar. Hard to tell. Uh, I couldn't get up there, but. It's quite a ways out if, if, if uh, you want to 
you were out there, you told about how to get into this. So, and then the other part of the story holds on the residents um, were installed on the edge of the deck, as opposed to they should have been pushed back in, back to the wall, to the edges of the wall of the building, just further back. So the building actually appears, you're looking up at it, the story poles are too far out. They should be shoved back into the plane of the actual old building. So I don't know how that happened, but I, I didn't have a chance to meet with the contractor for that. So it'll look better than what's out there. So the, the good thing is the heights are correct, it just needs to be pulled back. Um, so um, that's story pole. So um, one thing just to pick up on the comment about, yes, the house is a store, is sort of a sad mess right now. And what we're essentially doing is working within the essentially the same footprint on one, but just reconfiguring this building. And even though we've added some square footage on this second floor and the third floor, it's not that different in terms of the actual building envelope. And um, the majority of the added square footage is the unfinished area under the house, the previous owner, as he was getting over enthusiastic during his foundation work, kind of created a little more underfloor space and, and finished it out more than uh, that was originally permitted for. So we're going through the process of legalizing that, but in essence, visually it doesn't add anything more to the house in terms of bulk because that's the, the original footprint and the building envelope for the most part. Um, so one of the, uh, the big issue that we are looking at it is, it's not a big issue, I understand why staff you know, came up with the idea of this third floor terrace being Large, it being too large is because numerically it doesn't work with what they've approved in the past. But there are, you know, our sense is this is actually to keep it the way we proposed is actually a better solution, both in terms of aesthetically, it works with what the building envelope is, the guardrail follows the perimeter. Putting it back 15 feet is just sort of an arbitrary spot and it doesn't quite make sense with the overall aesthetic of the building. It's, a, it's a, either a flat roof that's occupied or a flat roof that's not occupied with, with a guardrail around it. Um, the, from inside also, now with, I don't know if you would be, have perceived how three and a half foot guardrails now just feel really high and a, from the bedroom looking out at a guardrail 15 feet away really makes it feel like a cage and just pushing it back to the edge of the building just gives it a nicer feel in terms of looking out from, from the interior space. And so both, I think, from an exterior perspective and interior use of the space or visual sense of the space, the, I think sticking with what we've proposed is better. Um, the, there's a, we looked at, I went out there to look at what kind of impact this has on the neighbor, and that's when I gave you the handout. If you look at the site plan, we're at least 50, 68 feet away from this building, and at least 50, you know, almost 50 feet to the property line. There's a big space between this, this terrace and the neighbor at 39 Oak. Um, and we look down at them, and there's actually a, a very substantial canopy of oaks that would be between the house, between the upstairs terrace and the neighbor. Um, that side of the neighbor's property doesn't have any outdoor spaces. It's pretty much just the side of the building. There's already a pretty substantial vegetative screen along there. That's what the picture there shows. So I don't think there's a big impact on, on that neighbor in terms of the two, whether we're 15 feet away or another additional 11 and a half, 12 feet away, which is really the difference between the two, the two um, deck and deaths. So, you know, our, our sense is that it's not really a, a compromising any, anything in terms of the neighbors, but it is compromising something in terms of the design and, and the use of the space. Plus, this is a bedroom up there, not a living space. There's really not going to be giant parties of people hanging out up there looking over. It really is a, kind of just a quiet space that's, that just is nice to have this type of, um, have the rails be this way because we have flat roof there anyway. Uh, the other part of it is, we've thought about is when you go to 
people are going to be cleaning out those those roofs, uh, the drains and so forth. It's safer to just reach over the guardrail rather than try to climb over the guardrail and go to clean out your roof drains. And so there's a little bit of you know convenience of just having the, the edge of the deck where where leaves will accumulate more accessible if we keep the, the guardrail perimeter. Um, so I th I think as a whole we I don't think this is even though numerically there's an issue, I can see that there's there's looking at 900 square feet versus the 4, 400 plus or minus square feet, and maybe with the smaller debt, I don't think it's going to make any real impact on the neighbors. And if this is just sort of a, on a case by case basis, I think this will. But it, it, you can support, I think, keeping the deck as we proposed. Um, and I want to just bring up one. Uh, point that was brought up about the carport. And this is sort of an, an idea just to, to throw something out there. We had, our preference was not to build a carport. Um, it was because it was covered space was required and going through this process, we proposed doing that. But I want to just, you know, to consider is the possibility of rather than granting a variance on all these setbacks that are now, that have been triggered because we're building a, uh, a carport, maybe do a variance or an exception for not having a covered parking space. And I, I didn't have to run this by staff, so I don't know what's involved in all that. But if there is an option to perhaps not do a carport at all, it might be something worth uh, considering rather than going through all these uh, these variances for setbacks, et cetera, to, then provide, to actually provide it. Um, plus, it may actually make parking there easier. You don't have a physical obstacle to maneuver around, you might be able to get more small cars into there, a motorcycle, a couple of small cars might even be able to fit there without, with less trouble if you're not driving around a series of posts. So just a thought out of left field, something to consider if we're kind of throwing some things out there today. So um, I think that pretty much covers it. Oh, these, uh, yeah, yeah. So the vegetated screen that you know we're we're open to providing it if that helps. But as I sh you know the picture shows, there is a pretty good vegetated screen, and we actually don't want to run the problems with the fire department because especially the low canopy brush you need to be separated a certain amount. And I, I don't know if it, it may cause a problem with the neighbor who needs a certain buffer area for his house too. So I, I don't know what um, we're open to providing something if you think it helps, but I'm not sure quite where that might help, where, what part of that side of the property would help. Excuse me, through the chair, could you tell me where that vegetative screen is supposed to be? I, I missed that. I actually, um, because the, we just saw this with the staff report, um, I can point it out on the site plan. It would be somewhere along the, if you look at the site plan, the top property plan. So which the, which page? Uh, oh, the small the site, one. Uh, yeah, the one I just handed out. Okay, this one. You can see this. Yeah, it's uh, so it would be somewhere along here. We already have the. Can we go back to the mic? I'm sorry. Okay. So, so it would be along the top line, property line that's shown on the plan, and somewhere between there and and uh, the house. And, but as I said, there are canopies of oaks that we look through to even look at that house. Yes, so that's looking towards that, yes. Oh, okay, great, that's the thank house. you, that yeah. really helps. That's it. That, that really helps, and whose recommendation was that for the screen? Uh, it was part of staff report, and... If I can interject, um, this photo is very helpful. Um, so if you look at, at that photo, where there is some screening, but it does open up right in the area where there's a window. So what staff is recommending that that screen really be kind of continue to help buffer that their portion. Michelle, are you talking about the area in the center of this right. photograph or right. to the left? The right. The right. Oh, to the right. Okay. You can see there's a window. Okay. I can't see it, but I'll take your report. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Any other questions? Um, 
I just have a question because we're, we're sort of debating tonight as well house size and so one of the parameters I just want to ask you is, is um, there are a, a large number of people that are going to be living in this house or is it intended to, is there Airbnb thinking here or what's happening uh, with yeah. four, four bedrooms for sort of one yeah. person is, Maybe is, I'll ask, uh, is the Stacey question. To that. Why? Um, I know the Airbnb is not. <laughs> No, there will be one person living in the house. Um, you know, I moved to Fairfax for the peace and quiet. Um, and that's what I value and that's what I'm looking for. Um, in terms of, of the size of the house, it, the, the house dictated it. What's already there dictated it. Um, I'm just finishing out. And the additional space is really, it's as Anju mentioned, it's what's already there um, in, in the, what's the basement really. Um, it's most of it's there. The rest of it is picked up really from what's currently a deck. So it's really just using it more efficiently. That's it. Okay, now on this deck question, so you said that the deck has proposed the 900, apparently 900 square foot deck, um, would be just mirroring the roof, basically. And, okay, thanks. Yes, that it basically follows the roof. It cuts off a little bit. We don't go all the way to the edge of one of the, the, uh, the, the jaw gaps, but yeah. And can you tell me where the tree is the, that we're talking about removing? for the applicants for the moment. Thank you. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I did have a question for you. In, in terms of the roof line, <clears throat> I really like how you flattened it out rather than maintaining uh, the, the peak on that. It just gives it a, a cleaner look. I'm looking at page A4.1 of your original plans at the east elevation that shows, I believe, the deck we're talking about that extends from the upper bedroom to the edge of the roof line. Is that the yes. same deck that That's we've been correct. referring to? Okay. Yeah. And so then on In a moment. Okay, here we go. On the first page of the plans, A0, the bottom uh, isometric drawing is that same, that same elevation of that deck, right? Correct. Extending, I see extending to the edge of the building. And then, is the overhang open? to the floor below, or is that a solid overhang there? That's a solid overhang. Okay, so that's so, giving shade for the living room mm. and, and uh, dining room space. Okay, so all the way around, those are solid uh, overhangs, and they do shade that lower deck. Yes. And then the lower deck goes out to the edge of the roof. Is, yes. Is the middle deck, or the second story deck, I guess, is that the existing deck that's there today? So yes. that would not be expanded towards the front of the parcel. Okay. No, that is the edge of the, the current perimeter. The only thing we changed on that is 
on the side. We just angled it. There, there's a series of jobs right now. So if you look at the existing the sheet 83.2. There is a note of where the edge of the far right bottom side of the little of the main one went. You'll see that that's the jaw in jaw that the edge of the deck is right now. A21? A3.2. A3.2. One number. A3.2, yeah. And so you were saying there's yeah, a the job? the bottom right corner of the plan, there, the first note you see there on the bottom is the existing um, building, so the basic existing building below. And next to that is the edge of the, the deck right now, which is that dashed line uh, edge see. of existing roof terrace. So the next note above that shows the dash. So, we kind of connected the two. What we were trying to do was graph, you know, make the building a little simpler by putting the edge of the, the out, outside walls over foundation. Right now, parts of it sit on top of beams that are running across, so we pushed some of the living space. We weren't specifically trying to add space. We were trying to sort of rationalize the structure. Structurally putting, reinforcement. Yeah, ex exterior on top of exterior for the walls. That makes sense. And so the the proposed entry is still the main level foyer entry yes, to the house. Yes, it is right now. Well, the entry is an addition. So that foyer is an addition that, again, is sitting now on top of what is the foundation down below. Right, but it's in, so, in that same area, just yes, an it's extension. The same footprint. Sure, that makes yeah. sense because of the slope and all. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. I, um, you may do, um, is this the proposed color and materials, or Martin is there Lane? more information? Oh, that's one. There actually is yeah. materials for. Um, oh, okay, yeah, because I did have concerns because um, okay. this might be too light if this was <laughs> what was proposed. No, it, it is that the materials. And okay, so I'll I'll take a look at this. I may have more. Yeah, I have a. I think maybe a bit. This is. A, did you have color one? We have a color one. have color one in this? All we have is this. You should have a kind of a glossy version as well. That's I don't um, think I received that. I don't think I received oh, that. It's just that. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So that, that it's light. Yeah. Maybe, could you could you leave that with us yes, to look at? Okay. That's okay. 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 So you're removing, oh, be careful you don't back up. Yes. Yeah, go ahead and get. I'll let you get back so okay. you don't, uh, I don't cause you to fall. If it were me, I would fall. I would have fallen by now. Um, oh, so my question is you're removing all the existing siding. Um, there, yes, there is no, ex there's no existing siding on the lower floor, that's Tyvek, so it's very, very real. Um, but the upper, yes, there's nothing, none of the walls, none of the framing from the platform of the second floor deck, nothing is, is salvaged above that. So everything is pretty much stripped from the, the floor up. Thank you. Um, I do have a question um, about the material board. So what is, um, what is proposed for the, for the siding? Is that it is a it's a redwood elapsed siding and with a stain. Okay, so and it is what the materials board chose. Oh, okay. Here. Um, yeah, it just the word I didn't see it listed there. So is that been confirmed that that will meet the fire department? Yeah, a solid uh, a three uh, one by uh, siding meets movie requirements. Okay, real good. Yes. Any other questions for the applicants? I had a final question. Since I was only able to walk on the first level deck, is the view at the higher level deck above the canopy? Because from the first level, you still really 
Um, I would kind of look straight just out just to, like you, to the trees. I have not ventured up to the second floor. <laughs> so, it. Um, I would guess that it's not. It is not above the canopy. It. Is, in fact, um, I. It's not likely because those are tall oaks that are downhill, and so there are nice tan views through there, but they are going to be through canopy, through trees and so forth. But it's, yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. Thank you uh, for the moment. That'll do. And I will open up the public hearing to anyone else who would like to comment on this project. If you could state your name. Russell Hill, my wife Eleanor, who is here, and I have lived at 17 Oak Road for more than 50 years. We face the house in question. We have watched it evolve over the last 50 years. We have seen Stacy's plans. We are wholly supportive of what she is doing. The deck you are talking about would be of no consequence whatsoever because there is a canopy of trees that would make it impossible for us to even see it. Um, as I say, we are wholly supportive having looked at the plans of what she's doing. It, it's appropriate for the neighborhood and uh, it will be, a, be an, an, a vast improvement. Yes. Thank you very much. Excuse me, sir? Yes. Uh, what, what direction is your house in relation to this? Uh, if you were to stand on her on that current deck and look right straight towards Mount Tamalpais, we are across the street. So we are we, we face it directly. The house, our house is 17 Oak, but it actually fa faces onto Woodland. Sometime years ago, they numbered it like that. Well, that's fair okay. fact, isn't it? Thank you. Hi, I'm Mallory Van Willow Avenue. I have nothing to do with this house except my friend lives next door. But I just want to suggest that um, in terms of asking about solar, uh, my house included many places in Fairfax can't have solar. And it's very easy um, if that's uh, something you, you're, you're thinking about asking people to just uh, go on Google uh, or call a company, they go right on Google and I instantly can get back to you about whether the house can do solar or not. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lorraine Rose and I live at 101 Woodland next door to Stacy. And uh, if you're facing her house, I'm to the left. And I think the plans look great, and I hope everything goes through, and it's, it'll be a nice improvement, as Russell said, because the house has been kind of sitting in disrepair for a few years now with different issues. So, Thank you very much. Would you push the little button and turn our mic off down there for me? Great. Or, unless... Stacy wants to say something. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, just because I know the deck was a concern of yours, I don't think that will be an issue. It, it, it appears to not be any issue for our place either. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And we're facing. We're kind of above the house. Is like it's on a slope, so we're above that house. I don't think there's any. We just see like. The back of it, kind of. So, thanks. Where the lawnmower? Okay. Do you want to? Well, I think I'll, I'll save it for the next item. Okay. Uh, any other questions for the applicant before I close the public hearing? And uh, just one. Um, this, these, these decks that you propose. Um, is there any other area of the property that allows you know, that type of use of flat land or anything like that? Or are these decks really uh, 
kind of essential, or what's, what's the deal with that? The, um, certainly being the, the highest point of the, of the house, uh, or walkable surface of the house, there would need to be no, no other place you would get that view. Because certainly down anything at grade or on the patio or whatever, you wouldn't have as clear an open view of, um, of tan. It, both from, you can see tan from that second story level, but as you go higher, it will, it will, not, it will just be a nicer view up there. It's not the same on the two levels. And I don't think you can see anything like that from anywhere else. Okay, but what I was really asking is, is there any other sort of flat areas on the ground or is it sort of the deck an attempt, an attempt to, to make um, walkable and, you know, sitable oh, areas outside? I see what you mean. There is a, uh, a kind of level patio at the upper end, uh, behind the house. Uh, it's not immediately connected to the living space or really the deck. The decks are sort of an immediate living outdoor living space for the house. You can make it your way around the path to, to the to the uphill small patio area, but otherwise it, this is the main area. And I suppose there is a level area street at the street level if you walk down to the lower part of the house. Okay, thank you. So through the chair, the right parcel going straight up from the proposed uh, parking slopes quite a bit and uh, there is no development there it's it's natural until you get all the way to the back of the parcel with that other flat patio but uh, there are no uh, no significant views and it's it's quite a ways from the main residence as well okay um I guess my only question for you is, uh, I, I take it from your comments that you all would prefer the uh, size of the deck as originally proposed, but that you're not going to uh, be broken hearted and you know, to heck with the whole thing if we give you a, a decision that limits that deck somewhat and maybe uh, we if we went that direction, and we still have to talk about it, we could talk about the design of the rail and give you more flexibility to not make it feel like a cage. But um, just wondering how you feel about that size of the deck in terms of whether it's a you know, make or break issue for you. So through the chair, maybe we should have that discussion amongst ourselves. Okay. Um, I would be broken hearted, but I would not walk away. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it would be a shame um, because otherwise it wouldn't be used and it would look funny. Um, and, you know, to Andrew's point, you know, sure, if I had a choice, I would want the, the uh, railing pushed out. Um, but would I, um, would I appeal or, or make this process uh, longer? No. <laughs> But, but it, well, I, I, I got to tell you that deck, um, I, I talked about it often and fondly. <laughs> so the last thing that came up, I was like, oh, no, in my heart. But anyway, thank you. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you. OK, I'm, with that, I'm going to close the, the hearing and bring it back to the commission. Uh, who wants to start, Laura, if you like, uh, telling us how you feel about this? Um, um, I really applaud the applicant and her architect. I think that they've done a great job trying to um, deal with this house. And I hope Stacy knows what she's got herself into. But um, um, I really like the design, and I agree. I think I like the deck as they proposed it. I think that it looks looks better and it, it's it's flat space that's going to be there anyway and it could actually um, cause problems to put the deck railing in and cause waterproofing problems and you know major repairs down the road because it could cause um, leaking in that area 
whereas putting the rail on the outside, I think it would be easier to keep the house water tight. But um, I like the design, I like what you've done, and um, I, I would, I'm ready to approve it. Thank you. Uh, other thoughts, Michelle? I'll go second. Um, so I think this is a substandard lot, and for development to occur or subdivision to occur, there's a minimum lot size, and this lot is already smaller than the minimum required in the zoning district. And when we start talking about variances, um, the state planning law was created in order to address, regarding variances, in order to address properties or buildings that are not like any other property in that zoning district. It's a variance to the law. And I don't see that here. I feel that variances are cumulatively affecting, meaning that if you approve a variance, that means every other project after that, staff must consider that variance and go forward with a recommendation affirmatively if we approve it. I think that regarding the building, looking at page six, when you do a comparison of the lots, the building sizes um, existing here, I think in terms of overall building size, the bedroom and bathroom, this is much larger than the majority of other homes in the area. And here, on the one hand, we have the camp, uh, town council asking us to consider here we have on one hand the town council asking us to consider reducing building sizes but um, here we're proposing to allow expansion of an illegally built structure in a substandard lot size larger than the other houses in, in the area so in fact, I would recommend denial and going back to the pre-illegal construction. And yes, I do want to see improvements. I do think that the, the idea of moving from a partially built building uh, to a beautifully designed home is what we, what we want to see, but we want to see a lot more in compliance. Um, So I guess overall, I think it's, it's, it's just too large. I think the amount of time that we spend trying to get clarity from the architect is a good example of how the project's really just not complete. I mean, we're, we're looking at a lot of different issues here. Um, and I would say if we're gonna really move a lot towards variances and exceptions and all of that, that we should really be revisiting the code because the code's not making sense. And either we're either upholding the code or we're, we're not. So that's my thoughts. Thank you. Mr. Green? Yeah, I, I have only one issue with the project. I, I agree with Laura that, and, and the neighbors say that, you know, that that's an improvement to the neighborhood, and that's kind of 90% of it for me on this project. I think it actually looks beautiful. It's, a, it's a, going to be a gorgeous house. Um, the problem I have is with the number of variances we need to give here and the and trying to not set precedent for future projects like it um, so i'm i'm thinking i said this in the beginning this this carport um, I mean, con considering that it requires a variance and the owner has said they don't really care about the carport I'm just throwing this question out, like kind of like they did, is can we can we waive that safer than giving a variance to the setbacks here for the future of, of precedent on this? So, to my understanding, you would still have to issue a variance to the covered parking requirement. Well, the waiver of variance, right. Right, so so because they're adding a bedroom, they're under the code, they're required to have the covered parking. So you have to issue approval of a variance to the covered parking requirement. But there wouldn't be as much structure in the right of way. 
Right, and, and another thing is sort of on our deep list of things we're talking about is that the car court requirement is something ancient and we don't know why and, and we're even considering possibly getting rid of it. And that's one of the debates we're having. So that's where I'm coming from. So it's just a question I'm throwing out there and how we could do that. Otherwise, you know, I think, that, I think the project is great. It's a derelict house that needs to be fixed and you're brave to do that uh, always. And when some series of owners leave behind a mess like that, you, you get, uh, you know, you're kind of um, looking into an unknown, unknown issues. Um, but I, I could approve the project with that question mark of, and I have some conditions chain on, on the language of the um, of the of the uh, reso too, but we'll get to that. Um, excuse me. Can um, so can you clarify that we it is possible that we could um, because it's it's the it's the carport that's required is is requiring the variances. Is that really what's triggering variances for this project? And then, and we could possibly approve a variance for no carport. Is that correct? Covered. A covered no, for a variance for no covered parking. Yes. But you're no. trading one for another. No. Well, I'm just I'm just asking no. a question. Okay. That's all I'm doing. You'd have to get grant a variance, but the question is whether you're granting a variance uh, to well, the parking requirement because the the bedroom area. The mics don't always work well. It did, one thing to be aware of is that you're, you, yeah, in essence, you're trading one variance for another. Um, you're waiving the covered parking requirement, and um, as pointed out by uh, Commissioner Rodriguez um, and Commissioner Green. Um, that's something that is a consideration going forward with other similar projects. Um, we've been trying to get that <coughs> discussion for the town council. Um, the planning commission has previously uh, recommended consideration of elimination of that requirement. We're not quite there yet in terms of a council decision. So that's one of the challenges is to say, well, let's go ahead and, and, and grant this and assume or hope that they support that, um, I suppose. It's always difficult to walk something back once granted, but um, the, it, it's certainly an option. And if the commission feels that that there's there's sufficient finding justification for that, um, you, you can certainly do so. Well, I'd like to understand Commissioner Rodriguez's uh, concern a little bit better. So your question was, um, or the way I understood <clears throat> what was being said, it was kind of like six of one, half a dozen of another, do you couch this as a variance from a setback uh, or a variance from parking? And I take it that you see them as not six of one, half a dozen of another. There is some distinction between the two. There are distinctions between the two, but I think that the whole of my comments really relate to the reason why I'm recommending denial, um, which is that cumulatively the project, regardless even of illegal construction or not, is just too many tack-ons, too large of a building, too many bed bedrooms, to uh, what, what is the reason in the zoning district why we would want to do that? I, I'm not clear why. If we just rolled it back to the original, legalizing the first 895 square feet where she gets a bedroom, a bathroom, and storage area, and maybe she gets her deck, you know, whatever, I don't know, but, um, you know, that's a lot more reasonable in totality of the project than if we were granting all of this and hanging it on the hat of it allowing variances and when we haven't had the parking discussion and all of that. I think my end goal is how do we get to a final product where we don't have illegal construction out there. That's a problem. And then secondly, when we have an unfinished project out there, that's, that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Commissioner Swift. Um, 
The only concern I have on this project is um, the second floor deck, taking it out that far, because when you look at it from the street, I know there's, um, there's oaks in front that maybe haven't been trimmed, or it seems very massive. I think when you look at having that deck there, that would be my only concern. I'm not concerned with the size of the project. We have a 5,000 square foot maximum floor area um, now, which this fits under. So besides legalizing the bottom 800 feet, 895 um, square feet, there's like 300 more, so that's being added on in various parts of the building. So I don't have a problem with the size of the building. Um, I would keep the carport there, uh, realizing that the variance is needed because that's a structure in the public right of way. But other than a little concern I have with the size of that deck being pushed out as far and making that look more massive, that would be my only concern. And you, uh, you're not opposed to the carport, but you're, you have a preference over the uncovered parking versus the carport in terms of the setback question? I would go with um, the carport right now. It, it is, you know, the requirement. Okay, so um, we have an owner here who has inherited uh, a, a number of problems. Stacy, you are a very brave woman. Uh, I would not have taken this on. However. I think that um, she and her architect have done a, a tremendous job taking uh, a sow's ear and turning it into a, a very lovely home. Uh, I actually love the design. I love that you changed the roof line, which while it is maybe a little bit higher than what's there now is, uh, so much more attractive and reduces the overall mass of the building. I think it breaks it up beautifully. Um, I was walking around out there. When I saw the square footage, I thought, whoa, that's a big house. Uh, but when you start walking around, you realize, one, it's already there. The footprint is there. And uh, they're kind of tweaking it to make it more livable. Uh, in terms of the deck, my, my first impression on hearing staff comment was, well, that, that makes sense. But then in looking, at, in looking at the elevation of the building overall, I think that uh, I wouldn't want to see another room out there, but I have no problem with a railing that extends to the end of that lower floor, which structurally, I think, makes a lot of sense and provides a feeling of expansiveness uh, that I, I, I would certainly appreciate were, were I in that bedroom. The lower deck, actually, it looks kind of big, uh, but I walked it, and it's not that large. Um, and the, the, the site is the remaining, the remaining parcel, which is actually the second parcel that is undeveloped, is uh, one very sloped and as difficult or more difficult to develop than the existing parcel. Uh, and there's no need to do that. I, I appreciate that you have kept everything with the footprint that's there today. And I, I, I wouldn't think it fair 
to require a new owner to take it back to whatever previous condition we might agree upon at some point. I'm sure that would be an interesting discussion to figure out what exactly we might take it back to. So uh, I, I truly appreciate the look and feel of the place, just in and of itself and, and in that site. Uh, it's big, but um, it doesn't look uh, out of character to me. The house immediately next to it is, is comparable. Uh, the one uh, in the photograph, uh, the blue house across the street, kind of down below, is smaller, but it's also much lower uh, in, in elevation than this house. So, uh, actually, I, I love the design of it and the lines of the roof. Um, and the fenestration, the windows. In terms of the carport, um, it, it's the parking there is tough. I had to round, I had to go around the top of that mountain two or three times to find a space and come back. And then I believe the owner and someone else were there, and they they left. And I thought, well, I can pull right into the front. But I did realize it was tricky. I thought so if. If there's a garage door here, would my car get in there and swing around and make it in and then backing out of there? So I can see the logic of not building a garage because one, it's, it's more structure, there's not that much space there. And I, uh, I have more of a problem with infringing with physical structure on the right of way than I do the people parking there who, who come and go and, and, and don't leave a structure. So um, I, I believe I would be, and, and it's all a matter of trade-offs. Uh, they've had to design it with trade-offs. We, we need to look at that. And our codes are changing quite a bit. Uh, no, we don't have a limit on square footage. Uh, would the decking count as part of the square footage? Is it now, so it's now included in, it is not now included in the 3,500 square feet. So right now it's still well below our 5,000 maximum. We might be going to less than that, but is it fair to hold this project up for something we may be doing in the next few months? Uh, so I, I believe I would be more willing to waive the covered parking requirement because I find that construction in the right of way would be more detrimental to the look and feel and the environment and the space there. So point of clarification, because um, you mentioned garage and garage door, so correct me, it's only a carport, right? So not a full garage. There was apparently a garage there back, back in the day. Right? But the carport would still require structure. I mean, it's it's almost like a garage without walls. So uh, I guess in summary, I, I would be willing to, to compromise and, and, uh, and uh, approve the more extended deck. Okay, well, um, let me, um, can I just come out with some, some additional conditions for the rezzo? We can just get those out there and see. Um, they're not too extensive. So from page six of the report, the staff report, uh, there's mention of the uh, uh, vegetate uh, station screen, and I see the picture, and I think that would be a good condition to add. Um, that, that mm -hmm. they, I'm sorry, is that page six of the staff report, Phil? Right. right. Mm -hmm. Did we have? Do we have that condition in there? Yeah, it's actually it's actually on page three of the rezo under that top of the page mm -hmm. under item E. Okay, perfect. Then the next one is from page four of the report. The town engineer mentions some things that um, were recommended. Um, so he recommended that the 
projects approved to be conditioned on require a submittal of the following items, a, a supplemental geotech report uh, and a consideration of a carport entry stir foundations in the supplemental report. Um, so if, if those conditions can somehow be added, um, that would be a recommendation. Is that in number two? Is it in number two? Is it in number yeah. two? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, very good. Well, that's that's perfect. Um, and I, I think one of the problems with the upper deck is the kind of fencing that you're trying to use also is it seems to be kind of maybe there's a reason for that. You don't want kids up there and they could fall out and et cetera, but I, I, would, I would think a lighter railing, a lighter looking railing, might eliminate some of the problems of the massive look of, of that deck. Because it can't, with this railing, it could look like a wall almost. Right. I'm a big animal lover, and I have little tiny dogs, and I don't think Dogs, okay, I was thinking kids. Dogs is the same thing. Okay. Um, Phil, thank you for I believe it's the, you're proposing a wire, correct? So it's pretty transparent. It's not like solid, it's not like boards or you right, know, right. pickets or sticks like you normally see. It's wire, so it's kind of see through. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that these parts of the report that were recommended are in the conditions. I didn't notice that. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to just have a couple thoughts here. So uh, I am. I feel somewhat torn because I agree with Michelle about the size here. We've been talking about, uh, the town council's pretty much directed us to consider limiting the maximum uh, floor area and we've been talking about, you know, a, a limit of even 3,500 and this would exceed that 3,500 square feet. Uh, if it's approved. Um, at the same time, I also uh, have concerns about uh, after the fact approvals of illegal uh, construction, even if it hasn't really changed the footprint because it just kind of encourages people to uh, just ignore our uh, town planner getting all the requirements, although I also recognize that that's not true for the current owner. Uh, and so we are in sort of a, a quandary in terms of how do we uh, maintain our standards and make them enforceable and at the same time uh, address a, a reasonable application. And so I, I do understand Commissioner uh, Gonzalez's, uh, I mean, Rodriguez's um, concerns about the number of different uh, sort of aspects of the project approval here. Um, <clears throat> I don't think, however, that limiting the roof top terrace on the, the third story rooftop terrace is necessarily uh, going to resolve that issue. And I also understand the um, architects uh, telling us how, you know, the house kind of dictated what the size and shape and, and look of this was going to be before uh, they started kind of working on it, and so it's sort of an organically uh, developed. I do think that uh, it doesn't make sense to require a carport when unpaved uh, parking area, and I would hope it would be uh, rain friendly, like not necessarily just flat concrete, um, but that that might be uh, at least some mitigation against some of the other elements of what we're doing here. I think um, if the footprint of the parking were the same just without the carport, that might make sense. And so 
Um, I don't know where we're standing here. I kind of feel like we might not have uh, unanimous. We obviously aren't unanimous here. Um, but in terms of the size of the rooftop terrace, I don't know where we are. So I think I think we're current. I think we're currently at four uh, or f five to one in approval, and uh, you have a majority who is supporting the carport. Um, may I suggest maybe we poll because um, I actually forgot to. to and, you know, get my thoughts on her. Um, but I don't know if anyone else did also, or and they may have changed as you know her other commissioners' comments. So poll everybody on uh, would we want to require carport as opposed to uncovered parking? Yes, and I think the deck as well, because I think there's two. I think there's two major issues that we may be divided on, and well, plus there's some others, but I'm not sure if the other commissioners feel the same. Can I ask you a question? So right now the parking area has the foundation of the old garage there, and then I can't remember what the, the parking space to the right of it is, if that's just dirt. Yeah. It's also paved. That's also paved. So, what is the plan for the flooring of the parking spaces? The one, I know there's a brick partially for the third one, but for the parking space to the right, what is the, the plan for the flooring of that? And then also um, where the carport might be, or if the carport wasn't there, what would flooring be? there. And would those two spaces be level? We were proposing on um, keeping those as concrete spaces, the ones that are that are already there as concrete. And on the driveway where it's brick right now, we're going to extend the brick on that area. But if there isn't a carport, you know, we could consider other options with that. So it, it just seems like with the carport there'd be a foundation and some perimeter and it might make more sense just to keep the concrete on the upper level. Could you tie that carport into that existing foundation or that's there now for the old garage? We probably can't use it in terms of we will need some peer support because that will be for peers for the foundation. So most part, we'd probably be chipping out at least a partial, and there might be a little retaining wall that's kept there, but for the most part, the support for the carport would be for point loop and probably a tie beam between them. Thank you. Through the chair, could I ask the uh, project architect a question? You know, Commissioner Swift just asked without asking, but go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sorry, I forgot to ask. The I'm not, I, I don't think it's a retaining wall, but the stucco cactus wall along the left front of the property, does that remain as is? For the most part, yes. We're cutting a little bit off because we're creating this new retaining wall to, to do our third parking space in tandem. Um, but otherwise, that will that will stay. That so that. Whatever is there right now is a shoulder will stay. Okay, and and if if the commission were to recommend no carport, would you consider making the parking area um, what's the word for um, no so yes pervious pervious. Yeah, permeable, so that the so that the water wouldn't just run off it down the street, but soak in uh, in some way. I think that that would be a, a reasonable trade-off in terms of yeah. I think that would be like if we Attractive. do everything. Yeah, it, it's certainly better to do that to have a permeable surface. Thank okay, you. thank you. Linda, uh, can I just talk about procedure a little bit because I just want to remind you that. 
the plans have been available for the public showing a covered parking space and at this point I believe that if you are going to go the route of, of granting a variance for covered parking you will need to continue this because the neighbors and everyone have to know that that's happening you can't change the project at the meeting that significantly I mean it's one thing to change a window location but there might be people here that are, aren't, aren't here because they think there's going to be covered parking in compliance with the code, and then all of a sudden there isn't. Right? That's, a, that's an excellent point. Maybe the chair could ask the applicant if they would be willing to continue. Well, let's uh, maybe poll here okay. before we go there. Um, in terms of those of you who are inclined to approve this project in some form or another, um, <clears throat> could I just hear from each uh, commissioner, starting with Commissioner Swift, whether you would be okay with the original size of the proposed rooftop terrace? I could go with the original. Commissioner Green? I could go with the, uh, with the original size as well. Commissioner Ferguson? I, I like the uh, extended deck to the edge of the property as originally proposed. And Commissioner Carolyn? I prefer the, uh, the deck as originally proposed. And I think I could go along with it too. And uh, so starting on the other side, uh, Commissioner Caroline, would you uh, be inclined to approve the project with the carport the way it is proposed? I would prefer no carport. Commissioner Fergosa. I would prefer no carport with a new treatment of that entire area that uh, catches and retains water. I think that would be a, a, a good trade-off and improvement. Commissioner Green. Well, I think Commissioner Swift's idea is great, and I, I didn't support a carport from the beginning, as you know. So I, I would uh, say that a permeable surface uh, for parking would be a great idea. Problem is now what, what Linda has said about the public notice that we have. Um, I'm a little. I, I really. Yeah, that's a. That's a. Um, you know, right to be heard issue. So um, it's, it's a problem for me at this. Since you said that, uh, of course I realized it, but didn't think about it. So um, I like the project though, and I don't really want to hold it up. So, so I'm kind of on the fence, literally, about the car. Commissioner <laughs> Swift. I'm unsure at this point as far as um, I looked at that space and one of the questions that I had was when I looked at the plans um, is how tight the parking would be for the three spaces. You know, with the with the carport there, but the plans show that it is doable. Um, you know, wouldn't hold up the the project to go with the carport. Right, an additional comment about carports. Um, we have a carport. We have dented our doors on the carport posts. We have into it, um, you know, and then they are they are an issue. And then garages are actually better, personally, because you kind of have to get in there. But um, so so I'm really on the fence about the carport right now. Does it make sense for us to ask the applicant whether they're willing to postpone a final decision on this application, knowing full well that? can't really predict what we're going to decide in another hearing because we would have to public notice it and again hear from the public about all the things but you know there's a possibility that we could take a vote tonight the way it's proposed or we could postpone it for a month and, and take another vote 
at our next planning commission meeting uh, on a different proposal that potentially had not a carport but uncovered parking in that area. So I guess I want to put you on the spot and ask you if you want to make that kind of a decision or leave that up to us. Um, can I ask a question first? Sure. <laughs> so if the change is um, not any more intrusive um, and it's uh, actually a material um, change for the better, right? That's taking away structure, it's not adding a structure. Um, you know, of course I can't speak for them. Oh, my neighbor's like, oh, there's one neighbor. So I have one neighbor here. Um, I can't imagine anyone who's going to object to taking down a carpet, and it's not there. To building one, actually, to building one, because it's not there. If anyone objected to the situation as it is now, they would be here, and they're not. So it would be a shame uh, to delay this a month for probably something procedurally the lawyers are going to say you don't need to do anyway. Um, and, you know, and I'm very respectful of the process and I, I appreciate working with Michelle and the staff um, you know, for these uh, uh, maybe nine months, I'm not sure. Um, and so I really, really, really would appreciate um, a decision tonight. Um, I, I, I hope you'll consider kind of the practical reality of those procedural issues where, um, you know, it, there, it's not really an issue. Um, I, I'm, I'm asking you to consider that and, and maybe take a vote tonight on not requiring the carport. Is that possible? I think, well, unfortunately, I am a lawyer, so I'm going to tell you that I would probably advise my fellow commissioners to listen to staff on that. Yeah, so I, I realize I'm kind of putting you in the spot to make a call on that, but that's life. You know, you, know sure. you, you could take action on the project as proposed and people come back for modifications. So it's... Do they have to pay the fees all yeah, over again? See, that's... Do. I don't want to have to make her do that. Yeah. Then you, you, then you the, the other, the other yeah. issue with, with notice on the carport issue for another month is that... Um, it, it's not just neighbors who might come out. It could be anybody who reads the notice, well, we're not going to have a carport, looks at the ordinance and say requires a carport, and then comes seriously to protest that we're not following the ordinance rather than a neighbor who has a problem. That's more important, actually. We don't think your neighbors are going to have a problem. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, additionally, uh, it's anticipated that the town council will be taking providing some direction on the zoning changes that accompany the recommended work program. And one of those items has to do with uncovered parking. Were we to continue it and the town council were to opine that they would like to retain the covered parking, it's unlikely that staff would be able to come up with some findings. So perhaps one of the questions would be, does the commission feel strongly enough about the proposed carport that were that to go forward as part of the proposal tonight, they would be inclined to uh, uh, recommend denial of the project. In other words, if, we're, if the project as proposed were up for a decision tonight, would your commission approve it with the carport? I mean, that could be a simple poll to say, would I, would I support that as part of the total project? And then ask the question. I, I get the sense that uh, Ms. Loveless would very much like to have a decision tonight, especially if it's uh, affirmative uh, in some reasonable facsimile of what she's proposing. Well, and if the uh, council were, after we approved the project with the larger deck and the cardboard, would, uh, and the council were to take action, conceivably not to change the ordinance requiring the cardboards, is that what we're saying? Correct. Yes. How would that impact a, a project that we'd approved that well, required a carport? Well, I guess what we're advising is that because the variance requested is different um, and that there's been no discussion in the staff report, so in essence, the project that the commission would be deciding would be unknown to the public. Um, and so there's a question of procedures and notice and adequate notice and um, things like that. So the question would be if we continued it and the council said, 
we think that the covered parking requirements should remain, then I don't think staff would recommend approving something, even if we're noticed uh, with an uncovered parking. We would say this is so. I know, but what I'm asking you is the opposite question, Ben. What I'm asking you is if we approve the project as proposed requiring covered parking, and the town council were to say, we're not going to require covered parking in our ordinance anymore. How would that impact this project? Well, the, the project, as if you were to take a decision with the covered parking, in essence, it would be more restrictive. So there's no problem with making a project, doing an approval that's more restrictive than, uh, than uh, whatever. Okay. Uh, through the chair, my question is, if we approve the project as it is now with the carport that nobody seems to want, and the council, I understand the difficulty of council says covered parking is required, that it would be difficult for the applicant or anyone to come back and request a variance of it. However, if council says, sure, let's forego the covered parking requirement in certain circumstances. Could this project then come back and request a modification based on that? Yes, although insofar as the council is likely to render opinions in that regard on August 1st, my recommendation would be, I think we still have time under the Permit Streamlining Act, this was just being complete recently. So my recommendation would be to continue it for a month notwithstanding the, the long and winding road that the uh, applicant has had to undergo. The so, problem is that you're saying it could it could not. Correct. And that in which they case, could not remove the covered parking. Right. In which case, we would basically be back with the same project. I would imagine it would be a rather quick discussion with the commission, given the uh, general support of the project, with the exception of the covered parking. So it'd be up on the agenda, quick discussion. Session. So in, in summary, I think for the applicant's benefit, we can either approve it as is with the carport now, or we cannot at this time approve it without the covered parking. But didn't you say we could do a variance to the covered parking? But we'd have to notice it. But we would have to notice it. Okay, so. We could approve a variance, however, okay, we Norman, couldn't do that tonight. I'm going to have to notice gonna take, it and continue. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to take a poll. Um, Commissioner Swift, if we were to... No, why don't we just, why don't we just have a motion? Well, let me, let me just remind um, everybody that the, the question that was raised about the covered parking is that the, the setback variances that would have to be granted for it are also kind of onerous, and we have nobody from the public objecting to that, actually. So, thinking this through now, I'm kind of the fence going this direction to say, let's approve this permit with the covered parking, but asking you, is, is there kind of a procedure that they can come back without a hearing to, to eliminate that? No. This is a, a tricky question. It's sort of like a callback clause. Um, and somebody uh, with a lot more legal uh, background than I would have. I, I have heard of sort of redressing mistakes. Uh, this would, in essence, be a mistake. It would simply be to keep the option open of revising it. The reality is that if the town council were to support that, the applicant come in and say, hey, I want to get this variance. And, uh, you know, at that point, the, we would still be in the process of amending our regulations, mind you. Um, but we would probably be able to process that. We also have to come up with findings for uncovered parking because there's the precedent as I want to get this moving, so I'm going to just kind of take control here. And uh, I actually had some language on the encroachment permit part of the RISO, uh, which was similar to this language that Commissioner Green proposed last month on one of our resolutions. Uh, it's the encroachment permit on page two, the area within which improvements, stairs, wooden and concrete retaining walls, and fencing will be located, is not being used for vehicle or pedestrian travel, and therefore approval, 
Therefore, under, therefore, comma, under the circumstances of this property, comma, approval, and I would add, of a revocable encroachment permit to retain these improvements within the town right away, blah, blah, blah. Um, so those are my recommend, that's my recommended change here, uh, as well as at the top of page three, uh, where it says under A, the size of the third story rooftop terrace shall be reduced in size. And I think we cross A out and uh, probably cross B out and just make B the rest of the sentence. Um, so, yeah, those would be the changes I'd make if I was going to move to approve this. And with the addition of the requirement number 13, requiring the tree um, I'm really good with what Mimi just proposed. Could I ask a question, please? <laughs> sure. How much would the fees be uh, to come back? So if, if it were to be approved tonight with the carport and then I wanted to come back, to remove the carport, how much how much would that be? I'm pretty sure you know the, the fees are for the processing. So I know that the use permit fee is identical to the original fee. I'm pretty sure the variance fee just stays one thousand one hundred and twenty-five dollars. So that's the application fee for a variance. And then it would come back before us, mm -hmm. correct, as a new Right, with, with the request for it to have no covered parking, which you would then have to make the legal findings to support your decision. And Commissioner Rodriguez would have another opportunity to try and convince us not to. So $1,125. Versus the cost of the car for it, I wonder. Yeah, I think it's at least $10,000. It's a lot more than that. Okay, well, based on this, I could make a motion to approve um, this project, uh, Resolution 2018-10, with the uh, changed language that um, Commissioner Newton uh, proposed. And the new item 13. And the new item 13, yes. Is there a second? I'll second. And let's go one at a time. We'll take uh, the roll. Rodriguez? No. Swift? Yes. Green? Yes. Fragoso? Yes. Caroline? Yes. Newton? Yes. Okay, so your project has been approved. There is a 10 day period which someone may appeal it. They have to pay a $500 fee to appeal. And if there's no appeal, you're good to go. So, so approved with the carport with the larger deck? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, have a great night. Thank you, Michelle. Can I just ask one thing, is that possible? Quickly. Yeah, I live next door and I can speak for myself and the other neighbors who had to leave. Um, we're the only two properties that would see the carport um, or not carport. There's no carport. There hasn't been a garage there for several years. I think it's an improvement to not have a garage there. It gives more openness to the whole thing. And it seems like you're all in agreement. Yeah, it's we're better, done. better to not have a carport. So I guess all I'm asking is it seems like the, the main reason you wanted to have the carport is because to do with notice, because you would have to give notice to neighbors. I, I, I don't think the neighbor, I can't imagine any neighbors that are. Yeah, it's, uh, it's already done. Okay. And if they wanted to now get approval of not having a carport, they're going to have to come back and, and get a modification to the approval that we just gave them. All right, so we are ready for our next. Uh, agenda item. Can I request a, a, just a quick, like, oh, two yeah, minute let's break. take a little break. Well, how about a four minute break, Laura?
All right, let's uh, bring this meeting back together. Yeah, that's because we're so interesting. So Ben, you're up. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. <clears throat> uh, this. Uh, item concerns the uh, third uh, public hearing uh, before the Planning Commission regarding consideration of a reduction in the maximum size allowable size of a residence uh, single family or duplex in Fairfax um, the Commission previously considered uh, this item at their May 17 and June 21st <laughs> probably be better that way um, at those meetings um, at, out of the most recent June meeting uh, it emerged that there really wasn't a consensus among the Commission concerning reducing uh, the overall square footage um, and among the issues that were cited by the Commission uh, in contributing towards the diversity of opinions um, was that there would be very challenging to address properties that now would be newly rendered legally non-conforming with respect to maximum residential size i.e. their residences would be larger than what the new code would allow and um, the Commission evaluated that under any kind of substantial reduction in maximum square footage that would take place um, it's not sure what issues uh, a lower maximum residential size would really address um, that the council had come up with some rationales but has never really fully articulated their concerns or issues um, that the town's current regulations and policies have served the town well um, that you don't generally see a lot of people complaining about decisions um, and the new construction that's occurred in the town and certainly the character of Fairfax as much as it has always been um, and that there are other approaches besides uh, reducing the maximum square footage that could uh, effectively control further control or limit large residences if that were what were decide, uh, desired um, it is it's also been pointed out that the town previously considered uh, reducing maximum house size, house size in the period from the year 2000 to 2002 um, and that prior to that time they did not have a maximum size and they arrived at the 5,000 square foot maximum at that time um, and then finally uh, last meeting because it, it appeared that there uh, we were getting close to rendering a decision on a substantial reduction we did um, make sure that we noticed people uh, in the range of house sizes that the, the town council had previously discussed i.e. Uh, anybody larger than 2,500 square feet and uh, that was approximately 450 people that are properties that were noticed and we did have a good turnout at that meeting I'm not sure um, if I recognize a lot of people who were there last meeting I think they sat and heard the Commission's variety of opinions and the lack of consensus and perhaps some of them didn't uh, show up tonight but in any event um, those were the contributing factors towards uh, the Commission lack of direction on changing the existing regulations uh, the Commission did reach a consensus that small sheds um, that did not involve any utilities electrical plumbing etc up to 120 square foot which is a cutoff for requiring a building permit um, should be exempted from the consideration uh, of contributing to maximum floor area currently all structures on a property count towards that so that was a consensus and the other was uh, with some very good discussion um, by architects on the Commission um, that the green building technology uh, uh, floor area bonus uh, that the town again being ahead of its time in many ways um, had inserted into the zoning ordinance was really no longer necessary and that the state has adopted numerous uh, applicable codes uh, involving new construction um, that essentially achieve the same uh, benefits uh, in terms of uh, energy efficiency etc so 
given that, the, the question is, is what does the commission recommend up to the, to the uh, town council? Um, on page three of the staff report, there's a number of options for the commission to hopefully take action on tonight. Um, the first would be to make no changes, and obviously if there's no consensus to make some change or to pursue one of the other options, that in essence would be the uh, recommendation by default. Um, another option would be to develop zoning ordinance language that would heighten the review of larger structures. And as noted, this could be achieved uh, various ways, um, basically relating, for example, with new findings, heightened findings relating to visibility, runoff, grading, tree removal, etc. So uh, it wouldn't change the maximum square footage, but it would say that if you're above a certain square footage, you have standards that you would have to achieve, uh, additional standards, and, and we would develop that. Um, and then the, uh, there's a possibility there could be a special exception process versus a variance, so not quite the same findings. Um, but just recognizing the unique circumstances of larger homes. Um, another one would be to uh, recommend a reduction, um, but also include language that would allow owners uh, these, you know, depending on the size uh, of the reduction, um, it would be between several dozen and several hundred homes that would now be non legally non-conforming. Currently, our regulations are pretty restrictive about approving uh, variances, what would necessarily be variances to build above whatever the maximum square footage is um, that's contained in our non-conforming section. Um, and aside from the fact that that should probably be rewritten because there's internal inconsistencies in terms of what you use as the basis for non-conformities, et cetera, um, the question would be to be fair to these people who were completely unaware of that their homes could be non-conforming at some point in the future when they bought their homes to allow for some special uh, exception, well, some allowance that they could uh, restore those buildings uh, in the event of, you know, the, the classic example is an act of God, a fire, earthquake, things like that. But other examples would also include uh, if they were to exceed our standards for uh, what we consider a full demolition of a building, i.e. a more than 50% uh, remodel, we could uh, provide the ability, uh, even with a voluntary dem demolition, to allow them to rebuild that. And indeed, I mean, what we're seeing, of course, is that just because these buildings are large um, doesn't mean that they're well laid out. So the question would be, you know, much as the commission decided tonight, uh, there may be uh, good sufficient reasons why somebody with a large home simply uh, wants to add on some square footage to get a better functioning house. So that would be something to consider is uh, allow them to rebuild one for one without going through uh, a, a difficult process and um, consider allowing small additional square footage so that they could make the type of small improvements that people will the small improvements and additions that people typically want to do when they're investing in their property. <clears throat> uh, another potential would be to simply bifurcate um, as of the date of adoption of the ordinance, uh, or whatever date they choose, but typically it's the effective date of the ordinance, saying that, well, the category of buildings that would otherwise be non-conforming, but already exist, are no longer deemed non-conforming. So you'd run two parallel tracks. You'd have to develop a list. Um, one of the challenges the commission's aware of is that there isn't a whole lot of faith in what the county assessor's records give us in terms of a clear uh, record of square footage of buildings. Uh, certainly, they don't address any accessory structures. Um, garages, again, so that would be one of the challenges is what do you base that list on? Are you just kind of trying to, as people come in, you say, oh, gosh, you're not on this list, but you know, if you can prove that you've got permits or something like that. So that's another challenge, but it could be done. Um, it's not necessarily the, the most desirable option, um, trying to create findings to say this property on this side uh, has to limit itself to whatever square footage, but the property on the other side doesn't. Um, it doesn't have to be deemed non-conforming. 
it, it, it would be an interesting legal question. And then finally, uh, the last thing would be, and this is something that was discussed at the last planning commission meeting, is just to hire uh, outside professional assistants in kind of continuing to go through this. This could include uh, community surveys to get a better sense of, well, what do the people, the townspeople of Fairfax want? Um, uh, and, and hold separate workshops, as you can see, as we get closer towards actual consideration of ordinance language that more and more people kind of get involved. Uh, there's reason to believe that when this goes to the council, there will likely be lots of people in attendance at that. So uh, that's one of those realities that if we're going to go through a, an intensive process, to much like we've done with the cannabis, consideration of cannabis regulations, that uh, it's going to be very challenging for staff to do that and it's a work program item. So those are your uh, options. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, do we have questions for staff? Uh, I do. Um, just some clarifications. So on the staff report on page two, the first clear bullet references um, code 17.16. So I believe those should all be 17.016. Okay. Um, and then on the options, the first one states make no changes to the zoning ordinance, and that's kind of generic and broad, and shouldn't that really be make no changes to the maximum floor area? I mean, in essence, that is, I mean, that's kind of, yeah, what we're looking at, not generically making no change to the zoning ordinance. So I'm just throwing that out there. Um, and then just a comment, when we talked about from the last meeting, the planning commission consensus on the two items, one being the accessory buildings and the other being the green building technology. We weren't, I just wanted to state we weren't unanimous in that, so the term consensus should not equate to we all agreed on that. Because one of the things with the uh, accessory buildings that there was discussion of not including buildings that are 12 by 10, 120 square feet, we never got into the discussion of can you have six of those on the property? So, I mean, that was just kind of a statement that we talked about. There wasn't a further exploration of that, and it wasn't a unanimous, um, from my perspective, thought on that. And the other one was the same for the green building technologies. There was some discussion that the building code covers that, but there was also discussion that there could be um, potential technologies that have not made it into the code. And Fairfax being Fairfax shouldn't, you know, there be some concession for that. So I just wanted to make those comments before we got into the public comments or the meat of it. Okay, are there other questions for staff? So just clarifying, this is question time, right? We're just asking okay. staff so, good. questions. I do have a question for staff. Um, I'm sorry, can you explain four again to me? Yes. Uh, this is options. other options number four. I, I no. don't really understand it. Um, this is a lousy analogy, but it's almost like Prop 13, where you basically say, yeah. if you own a house at this time, then it's, it's considered this way. And if you buy it at a different time, it's considered differently. So you're, you're basically creating a, a base list, or trying to create a base list, that says, here's all the buildings that we think are uh, would be non-conforming if we consider them non-conforming, and they're in a special category, and so they're not going to be legal non-conforming. I'm not sure what allowances we would have. That's another question, is what would, we, would we say, in consideration with consistency of floor area ratio and lot coverage? Those would be the two things where we simply said, whatever our current regulations now say, those structures would continue to be governed. So 
The There's building just, code is that way. What's that? The building code is that way. Anything built prior to a certain year is built legally, and it doesn't have to be brought up to current code. No. Right, but the challenge would be, uh, this would be a little bit different because the idea is that if they wanted to expand it, well, this would be one of the questions is, I mean, whether or not you declared it non-conforming wouldn't matter if you were stuck. I mean, the label doesn't make the difference. The, the, the real difference would be, let's just say you had a one acre parcel and a 2,000 square foot house. In theory, under the current code, you could go up to 5,000 square feet. So anybody, uh, anybody who had a house at this time would be okay to go anybody on a vacant parcel would be subject to new regulations so whatever the limit was did that answer your question commissioner Murphy? any other questions or staff um basic uh, basic question here is um what the what the procedure will be? I, I took a look at the May second um, town council hearing, and I really heard uh, town council member Reed and Ackerman's concerns. Um, so, and and uh, so the question really is, you know, are we actually looking to set a, a maximum square size limit and that's the that's the issue here right that's the only issue we're looking at here correct not something else not including floor area ratio changes or anything like that that's correct are there questions Michelle, Michelle. can I ask what those uh, council concerns were in this regard? I didn't hear Well, they, they basically were, um, town council member Reed, I recall, said um, about the more cars coming into a house and more help having to be for the larger house and more energy consumption for the larger house. I think uh, member Ackerman echoed that kind of thing and also, you know, smaller houses are more efficient and those are the, those are the main things. My concern about those things is we well, it's supposed to be a question period. That was before our discussion. Yeah, May yeah. 2nd. So, so my concern is we kind of debunked a lot of that stuff. Um, and we've also approved a 3,500 square foot house tonight. Plus, so, so that's kind of an interesting uh, issue right there. All right, was there a question? All right, I have a question. Um, on option five, do we have an estimate of what kind of uh, costs for professional assistance to help us with this we might be looking at? No. Uh, professional planning consultants you know, typically run in the $150 an hour range, something like that. It would probably go to the council for clarification of what they wanted to do and if it were to turn into a programmatic discussion or consideration of really looking at a comprehensive program to consider this then we would come up with a, a, some kind of a budget my sense is the council probably wants to make a decision sooner rather than later but again there's a lot of factors okay um the other question is i think at our last meeting uh, Commissioner Green mentioned uh, that Novato had um, looked at additional areas as part of a design review approval process. Do you have a chance to look at Novato's program? No, but I would anticipate that it would be along the lines of the heightened design review option number two. Um, so that basically as you get larger, it gets more stringent. I also had asked that we look at uh, or talk to the town attorney about some of the issues that uh, public members had expressed about takings. I know Commissioner Green's done some of that and I want to ask him about that later, but I want to follow up with you now to see whether you got any input from the town attorney on those questions. 
Um, the challenge isn't so much with the takings uh, because regulations occur all the, you know, regularly that heighten restrictions on properties and, you know, some people are affected and can't do what they'd like to do. So that's, as long as there's a, a equitable um, and reasonable basis, it's not arbitrary and capricious that it's within the scope of what uh, we can do under the constitutional basis for these laws. Um, it gets interesting when you start to diverge the regulations. Um, you would have to be very careful about coming up with findings and bases for doing that. Okay, that answers my questions. Thank you. I, I have a question for Steph. What is the process here? So, council did not review our comments. Did you not review our comments with the council? So you're back to ask us to, this was a good clarification, a good summary, by the way, it was, it was very helpful. So now we're to look at this and look at the options and recommend which ones we think are most appropriate from one to five. Correct. Of the first other options listed, one to five. Okay. Okay, any other questions for staff? And with that, I will... You're buzzing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll open the uh, public hearing uh, for anyone who'd like to uh, speak to the commission on this matter. This time I wrote notes, so hopefully I won't sound like an idiot. Um, Miriam Weinstein, 703 Lane. I will say, um, when there's discussion of wall property, the town came out and clearly opposed the idea of mega houses. The fact that they're not showing up here. She remember, the room was full, and people did not want those big houses up there. Um, in 1990, Oh, well, I guess that part is not even relevant. Never mind. So I looked it up, and there's, I believe, 3,800 units of housing in Fairfax. I think 3,845 units of housing. I'm assuming that's including apartments. And council and the commission last time said that there were 24 houses over 3,500 square feet in the town. And that our primary concern was not to harm those 24 families, which constitutes less than 1% of the housing units in town. I think we need to be more concerned about the 99.5% of people in the community who want to maintain the community, the character of the town, even if someone didn't give a good argument and it was debunked because, well, they won't be using more people. That's not a reason to change the character of the town because you didn't like someone's argument. Um, so most of the houses above 3,000 square feet, I've spent a lot of time on real estate websites, seem to be in two small gated communities. So there's a Shadow Creek Brook and Baywood Canyon. So these are all new expensive homes. Unless these people want them to be bigger, they don't probably have any substantial problems. There aren't that many big, old, funky houses in town. There are some, but the majority are new homes. So I don't think there's that much of an issue. And you can do crazy things like Costa Hawkins. If it was built before 1995, you can have rent control. If it's built after 1995, you can't have rent control. Horrible bill, but that's what it is. So, um, da, 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 in 10 character of the town, I was going to say no 5,000 square foot house is green by the very nature of the size, as they were talking about. Not necessarily because people coming in and out, the amount of excavation, the amount of materials, that goes into a structure that size is inherently not green. It cannot by nature be green. Am I done? 
Um, if you could wrap it up, that'd be great. Okay. I just want to say I founded one of the first green building groups in the country in 1990 called Eco Design and Builders Guild. We put on educational workshops, conferences, sold building materials, and I tell you, if it's 5,000 square feet, it's not green. Thank you. Hi, uh, Larry Bragman, Hickory Road, and um, I support the concept of reducing the maximum house size here in Fairfax. Um, I went on the council in 2003, which was the year after it was passed, so that previous council had done some heavy lifting. But I think that was that heavy lifting was 16 years ago, and things have changed. Things have changed as far as our awareness and uh, the imminency of global warming, and things have also changed um, socially here in, in our country. And I think when you're looking at house size, you're not only looking at the natural environment, you're looking at the built environment. And you know how you protect your built environment does affect the character of your town. Because a larger structures, more expensive structures, are going to be inhabited by different type of people that would live in a smaller home. And to some extent, that built environment here in Fairfax has affected the character of the town. And if you look at the progression of our society from 2000 to 2018, the disparities in income, wealth, have all been <laughs> worse than just like global warming. Things have progressed in, in that way. So, you know, I think even tonight where you approved 103 Woodland, I talked to some of the folks that walked out of here. That was my next door neighbor. That was Gary Teflin's house. I lived next door to him for years on, uh, at 39 Oak Road. I didn't really realize it until the folks left. The house I lived in was maybe a thousand square feet. Okay, this new house I'm sure is going to be lovely, but look at the disparity now between the new house and the house I lived in. And you've approved it, with, you know, it's got my blessing at this point because I know the house was in disrepair, but that does affect the character of that little section of that hill. And if you multiply it out by whatever we've got, 450 houses that could be affected, that it does ripple out into the community. So by affecting the built environment, we do affect the character of the town. And I do think the smaller house size has inherently uh, greater environmental and ecological advantages. And we need to make a statement to be the leader that we've always prided ourselves on. So I, I encourage us to really take that step. I think the staff has done a really good job as far as giving you different options. I think all those options should get, you know, taken up by the council. You know, I think they've done a good job as far as that analysis. So, but I would encourage you not to be too intimidated by taking, you know, a courageous step. So thank you very much. Thanks. Good evening, Commissioners. Frank Hager, 13 Middleway. In, in reading the staff report uh, on the background, it says there's 447 potentially affected property owners. Um, what the Commission needs before is some real data to understand that. Are there 447 homes that would be affected by a, by a, a limit of 3,000 square feet or more? Or is it the 24 homes? And we have two subdivisions in Fairfax, uh, Shadow Creek and Fairfax Hills, where all larger homes have been built. Those are the only two in Fairfax. Baywood Canyon is not the town. So. I think we, the commission needs a data how many homes in Fairfax are 3,000 square feet, how many homes are 4,000 square feet, how many homes are 5,000 square feet. And if you've got that data, then you can understand the impact of, of changing the cap 
will have on the community. But I believe that the cap should include the garage and the accessory building, etc. I mean, whether it's 3,000, 4,000, 4,000, should include all the structures of the property. So, um, uh, just a little bit of the history. Um, back in around 2000, we were really concerned about house sizes in Fairfax and, and what we considered the start of gentrification. And so we went out to the county assessor's office to get numbers from the county assessor's office. And at that time, in 2000, the average size, home size in Fairfax, was about 1,350 square feet. Um, I wrote the ordinance. I wrote that first ordinance uh, that put a cap on home, on, on home size in Fairfax. And that cap was 2,400 square feet at the time. Um, that vote was, that ordinance was defeated on a two to three vote. Nicole Calderaro and myself voted for the cap of 2,400 square feet and three other council members voted against it. And then they turned around and put a 5,000 square foot cap on and that was approved on a three to two vote with Calderaro and Baker voting no. So, for instance, if a, if a cap of 3,000 square feet is, uh, is established, um, you, you really need to, to know how many, uh, how many homes, existing homes, is going to affect. Is it 24? Is it 447? You need to know that number. And, and, and in fact, if it's only about 24 homes, I think what Donald could do is issue blanket use permits legalizing the size of those structures and whatever size they are. And, and, and giving them either a use permit or variance and legalizing them. Um, and, and that would take care of those cons the concerns of those folks who do have a larger home that, that they would be left with a lower property value or, or unable to, to live in a house. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. I just want to point out, I, at our last month's meeting, the staff report had the breakdown of you know, the specific sizes and numbers. So take a look at last month's staff report. Yeah, I, I'm on my way north right now. So, uh, but are you going to vote this evening or? We're, we're not voting. We're going to be making recommendations and discussions that are then going to be provided, as far as I know, up, up to the council for further consideration. But you have the numbers. How many are at 5,000? How many? Well, just, just for information, I'm looking at it, the report here. Of 3,500 square foot houses, there were 28. 28 of them? Okay. Right. Oh, 3,500. Well, that's okay. That, that, was in, right? that was in a cumulative report. It's on page two of the staff report from last time, which okay. you can get online at North Jewel. Take a look at that. Okay. So, so at 3,500, I mean, that may be a reasonable cap. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. I'm uh, Jill Carson. I live on 36 Scenic Road. Um, and I am here to speak in favor of lowering the maximum square footage of uh, primary residences, as you suggest, to 3,500 square feet for new projects. Um, I don't know why it seems to be important to make other projects that already exist into so-called legal non-conforming. I would like to ask the question, can we just set up a rule so that new projects have to fit within that limit? That's my first question. Um, my comment is that so many homes in our town are less than 2,500 square feet. It makes it far too much of a financial, financial temptation for an investor to buy these family homes and turn them into 5,000 square foot mansions and then sell them for maximum profit changing the maximum allowable size for new projects to something much closer to what they already are will lessen this financial incentive. This would be for the good of the community and um, stop that destroying enterprise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, I'm James Riley, Spruce Road, Fairfax. Uh, I oppose any change to the maximum size limit for a few reasons. Uh, first, uh, we already have existing regulations that restrict home size. We have setbacks, height requirements, uh, 
floor area ratios, ridge line restrictions, those kinds of things, as well as a process that's already in place. And I thought tonight was a really good example where the town, uh, where the planning commission actually looked at a, a large house proposal, considered all features, all facets of it. We had uh, neighbors involved. I thought it was, uh, I was quite impressed. I've never been to the planning commission before. And uh, every, every house is a case by case basis. And I think all factors were taken into consideration. So for those reasons, I think we have in place already mechanisms to control house size. Um, it's overly broad and misdirected. I don't believe we have a monster house problem in Fairfax. I've lived here for 25 years. Um, I don't think that we would be here tonight talking about this if not for the wall project. So if that's really what's driving this, you know, I would encourage commission to focus on that project and that project specific and come up with regulations to deal with that problem. Uh, there's unintended consequences. Um, you know, it may, it may affect uh, many existing homeowners who will be affected and those that are actually right below the size limitation may be affected as well. Because any improvement that might throw them over the threshold will have to require variance. Um, and I think it's, it's an intrusive regulation that limits private property rights. And, uh, you know, government has, you know, very ominous power and authority. And with, with that comes great responsibility to wield that uh, very carefully. So I just encourage you to be very, very careful about uh, how, how this authority to regulate land use house size is uh, is imposed on, on existing, particularly existing property. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah Benson, Cascade Drive. Thank you, commissioners, and thank you, staff, for all the hard work you've done. Um, and I want to uh, say that I appreciate Ben's bringing up the fact that this issue has been in uh, discussion in our town since 2002, and I'm really glad it's getting addressed because I think that uh, Fairfax is being discovered, um, and uh, the character of our town is being threatened by potential monster homes. I would like to see, I would like to see uh, the maximum square footage on the lower end, 2,500 to 3,000 square feet. I have been fortunate enough to live on Cascade Drive for 25, 26 years. I was in my garden the other day and some bicyclists came down past my house and I heard one of them was looking around say, well this is a really nice old street. And it is. And this is a really nice old town. And there aren't many like it. And I think uh, what you're doing is really important. We have to protect it and I think that there are ways that we can do so and also preserve the property rights of the people whose houses now are bigger than whatever this maximum is that I hope you will adopt that's less than 5,000 square feet. And because it's been in discussion for so many years with the planning commission and the council, I think it's erroneous to uh, assume that it has to do with the wall property. So thank you. Thank you. Mark Bell, Command Guy in Fairfax. Um, I was going to come and recommend that we raise the limit here to 3,541 square feet. And so, uh, it's just kind of a coincidence that that's how things kind of worked out this evening. Um, so I think that that should be the upper limit. I really don't see um, uh, why we need 4,500, 5,000 square foot houses. I can understand the previous uh, person up who was saying about you know taking, et cetera, et cetera, but when we're looking at the wall property, or as I call it, Fairfax Cello, uh, not to be confused with Marin Cello that lost and they made a movie about it, um, 
you know, he jury rigged the property, uh, you know, the lot line, so that he's got like 10 acres, but all the houses are in this small area. And so if you start looking at, you know, lot size, et cetera, you know, it's not going to be applicable if you have what would normally happen on a normal lot. So I agree with Frank and Larry and other people that we don't need 5,000 square foot houses, and I believe that any layer that we can put on that will, pre, that will preserve the ridge line and prevent uh, the developer from putting in 12 houses to destroy the town uh, should be adopted. Thank you. At Mallory that Willow Avenue. Um, Michelle Simonson had to leave. Can I read what she wanted? Can I be her proxy? Is that okay? And then sure. she'll talk. All right, I can read her writing. Um, she said, I came to the meeting, but was not able to stay. Uh, I'm in opposition to 5,000 square foot houses in Fairfax for many reasons, but especially, especially the wall property houses due to the destruction of natural uh, resources. Natural, whatever word you put in. I love um, the land dearly and um, would be heartbroken if it was desecrated with giant houses. So that's from Michelle now. From me. Um, we're talking about things like what's going on in Novato. We are so not Novato. And I don't want us to be Novato and I don't want us to be Mill Valley and that seems to be happening if you look at some of the shops that are opening now. I want us to be Fairfax. Fairfax is unique and I think we should make rules and um, deregulate the ones that keep that from happening. I don't think that um, keeping regulations that, don't, that, that do not serve the town um, is, is at all a good idea or helpful for the town. Um, when somebody talks about uh, the size of the house, 5,000 feet is a monster house. It's all relative. In my book, it's a monster house. I don't want to see something above 3,000. 3,000 feet in my life is, is a large, a really large house. And I don't think we need to go above that. Um, it was said that a 5,000 square foot home will not affect existing homeowners. Well, yeah, it will. And there are people who live under it, and there are people who, um, in, in my neighborhood, I think there's going to be one above Ridgeway. It's, the land is already not stable to build houses. And we've had this conversation before when um, a, a family wanted to move their daughter in above Ridgeway, above the houses that um, were, were below that, that area. Um, and it, it, it didn't fly then, and I don't think it should fly now. Uh, I think what, um, what we are responsible to do for, for people who live in Fairfax and came to Fairfax and they come to Fairfax because it's Fairfax, is to not turn it into something that isn't Fairfax. We have a heart, we have a soul, we have a uniqueness, we have a community that when you start moving people in who, who are from a different realm, um, it's going to affect us. It's starting to affect us now, and I really want to see that not happen. Thank you. Thank you. Nick Schenberg, I live at 63 Dominga. Um, I agree with what everybody has been saying, except um, the gentleman who is saying that we have enough restrictions as it is with the ridge line and, and stuff and that uh, we shouldn't apply a size restriction. I think applying a size restriction is a very good idea. It should be for, for everybody, I mean, it's, just, it's, the, um, it's a really good way to make sure that, that we don't end up with something that's going to be too big for the character of the town. And I don't see there's any other way of doing that. The, this town is very charming and, and um, we need the past. We need to have a little sense of the past and we don't need the, all the houses to become these huge houses. Um, 
And I don't really understand how it would um, harm the people who have a house who is bigger now. In that house, those houses should be grandfathered in, obviously. Yeah. It's not like you're going to ask them to chop off some of their house if their house is... I don't think so, right? I mean... I, I don't think that that would be make any sense, of course, that they, those should be grandfathered in, but otherwise, uh, yeah, I think it would be great to reduce the size of the houses so we don't end up with huge houses. Um, there's not a lot of room here, it's hilly and everything, and, and it's just good the way it is. Thank you so much. Thank you. The Chen, would you turn that yes. mic button off for me? Thank you. Anyone else from the public? All right, closing the public hearing and bringing it back to the commission. And I'd like to uh, maybe try and move through this pretty quickly with some uh, quick questions one at a time. We'll do a little polling maybe uh, on the options that are, well, first off, I think the the one question about the consensus items that you had uh, discussed, and I definitely agree with Cindy that as the green building technology, as far as that was concerned, we did not reach consensus. There were differences of opinions with respect to the precise nature of the green building bonuses that might be uh, still potentially uh, viable given what California does and does not um, require. So I think I would encourage us to kind of go back through and tease out whether there are specific technological, you know, bonuses that might continue to be necessary. You know, on, on that point, the green building, um, you know, it, it, it may not, it, because of state law, it may not, as this says, no longer be necessary to have these provisions in the zoning ordinances. However, um, I'm someone who likes to have notice, and I think that if a builder comes to Fairfax um, and we, we're still mentioning the green building um, ordinances, but we're not getting rid of it, they'll be on more notice that we're following it. Maybe it could be more um, amended so that it's more along the lines of the state law in some kind of summary fashion. But I like it when it's kind of all there. So if, if you've got an architect looking at our ordinances, um, they know to go back to state law and follow that as well. Maybe we can even mention in our Green Ordinance 17136040B to D that you know these you know this isn't complete and you have to refer to the government code sections that are or or the greening uh, the green law of the state of California something like that um, rather than just getting rid of them I mean even if we agree they're no longer necessary we don't have to actually get rid of them. Could so, I ask you, so, you guys a question? So right now the green building is included in getting a bigger house. And what I thought I heard a lot of you saying is that you wanted to keep the green, you'd encourage people to do the green building, but you didn't necessarily want it to be used to get a larger square footage. And did I hear, could the you guys? The bonus for right. use of green building technologies. The so point that I was making was I heard some people saying, and I think Esther, a lot of information about this at our last uh, commission meeting about there are some things that California doesn't require that might still be beneficial for us to consider providing bonuses, density bonus, whatever the issue is, for those types of technologies that you know, California has not gotten around to requiring anyway. But for things that are mandated by state law, 
we should not be giving a bonus to somebody for doing what's required by state law. I think we were all in agreement with that conceptually. The thing I think we weren't in agreement with was get rid of the green building bonuses altogether. That's my point. Yeah, I, I, I agree. That's, that's, that's basically it. Thank yeah. you for clearing that. Okay, and then on the... I, if I can say, I also agree with that, and I would add that there may be new green features that we would want to require and not necessarily give as a bonus uh, that should be open for discussion. And then I don't know, Cindy, why you weren't, uh, why you had concerns about us not achieving consensus on the up to 120 square foot accessory building, uh, not counting against the maximum residential floor area size limit. But given, I think we did hear from uh, Frank Egger that uh, there were some strong reasons for, at the time, they decided to include all those structures uh, in that, so. So my thinking on that one was, um, A, we didn't talk about kind of the unintended consequences of that, right? So what if somebody has multiple 120 square foot accessory buildings on their property. You know, do you want to limit that? None of those would be included, taking that perspective, into the house size, into the maximum, wouldn't count towards the maximum floor area. So then you have almost kind of the reverse effect of, because I think People see this as the issue of your main house as the concern and not thinking through that we're including within that cap, you know, um, garages over five, you know, anything in excess of 500 square feet on a garage on a single family property or the accessory structures on a building, so you could theoretically have multiples of those and have a big house. I'm going to break in and interrupt you. I get that now. Thank you. I think the bottom line for that is we don't have consensus on that point because there are unintended consequences that we need to further flesh out. Now, to keep this moving on track, I would like to now have a little bit of a discussion, maybe one at a time, and maybe Linda, I'll ask you to put my commissioners on a okay. minute, you know, give them three <laughs> Wait, minutes or something like that. Before you do that, Chair, can I ask one question of the planning director? You may ask a question. Thank you. So, Ben, can you address, because some of the, um, public comments related directly to the wall property. Can you comment on anything you would do here affecting or not affecting that application? It's hard to predict for the fact that they, this application is already in process. In fact, he dropped off new plans two days ago. Um, <coughs> um, there's serious legal questions about targeting particular piece of property and one of the basis for government is you're not being arbitrary and singling people out. Uh, there's also a, just a practical matter of the likelihood of the application being deemed complete prior to uh, inception of these regulations and once the project's complete it's basically not, it wouldn't be applicable to that. Um, furthermore, you know, the, the, the question of maximum home size as has been discussed tonight predates any consideration of wall property. So this is obviously a top item that concerns more than just people worried about the wall property. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I'd like to go one commissioner at a time, maybe give them three minutes each. And I would like to focus your comments, and I don't care who goes first, 
on the other options list and your reactions to that list if there's something that you're gravitating towards or uh, have concerns with, I'd like to hear it. Maybe Norma, do you want to start? Sure. If, if I limit myself to these five options, I think that uh, I'm leaning more towards number four. If, in fact, we move forward with uh, a size limit on properties. However, going back to page two, I still am somewhat unclear about what problems a lower maximum square footage would address given the discussion we had about floor area ratios and lot coverage. So uh, the size of the parcel, in effect, limits uh, the size of the property that, that you can build. And uh, I think staff, Ben, I think you told us you'd need a 10, uh, you'd need, I forget how large a parcel you would need in order to develop a 5,000 square foot home. 12,500 square feet. Okay, so we'd have to look at how many properties are over 12,500 square feet. I know there's a number of them, but most of them are already developed. And um, I already said what my thoughts are on the green code, and so uh, I, is there something else I should No, that's good. Okay. Thank you, Norma. Okay, we're going to be in competition. Whoever can beat one and a half minutes. No, um, Laura? Out of, out of the, um, the five options, I, I most like number two. Um, I have other comments, but I'm going to say those till the end if, if I'm allowed. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Green? Number two. No. Oh. So, uh, number two is develop zoning ordinance language that would discourage residential construction, additions, or new buildings above a certain total floor area. Uh, Commissioner Swift? Um, I'm in favor of leaving the ordinance as it is now. Um, but clarifying 17.016.070 um, because it doesn't make sense and we need that to apply if we have any kind of a disaster or event that would affect the house now. Um, so regardless of, of the decision, I think that needs to be um, changed. As far as the other um, options on here, number two, um, to me that's Creates, um, is vague, creates a work effort to develop, and is, my, in my mind, an added burden on the homeowner. Um, number three, allowing existing homeowners to exceed a reduced maximum floor area within limits is vague. Um, and then having, um, you know, I don't know what that means. That would take a work effort to figure that out. Um, grandfather homes versus new construction. This would provide um, neighborhoods with, with different house sizes, different values. Um, I think that has unintended consequences. And as far as number five, hiring um, professional assistance. I understand um, and concur with the first sentence on the rationale behind that, um, but I'm also sensitive to the use of an expensive outside consultants, and I, I don't see us needing that process to, to go through that. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Rodriguez. So I am in support of Councilmember Reed and Ackerman's position that larger homes do yield 
higher energy and smaller homes do yield more cars and therefore does increase greenhouse gases. So the way that I think about this is it's a combination of these options because we have new construction and then we have existing legal buildings. So for new construction, I do believe we should reduce the maximum building size for new projects for um, those topics that I'm bringing up, ridge line, equity, geology, parking, energy, greenhouse gases. I'm thinking 3,000. This would require code changes, um, including floor area ratio and building coverage reductions. Um, anything above that, say up to 4,000, it would be required to install energy innovation so that the 4,000 square foot building would not generate or use more energy than a 3,000 square foot building, but they would have to go through an exception and no larger than 4,000, and it would have to re relate to existing building sizes in the neighborhood. So we heard about two areas in the community that already have large houses, I'm saying in there, is where maybe they should be directed. For existing buildings, I think they should be um, legally determined that, and, but we should encourage them to maintain and improve their property. So looking at section 17.016.040, um, it says right now that they can only improve something like 50%. I'm saying raise it to 75%. Um, of the cost of their properties on an annual basis so that we encourage improvement. So that's not allowing expansion of buildings, that's maintenance and improvement, maintaining an existing building side, size. I'd also like to see other code changes to variances to have it more stringent. I don't think we should be dealing with a lot of variances here. Um, that's okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Wow, uh, I like that option, Michelle. So I'll go with that. Um, I originally had thought I liked number two best and number one second best, but now I'm changing that, so my number one is this kind of combo approach. I know none of my uh, preferences make any sense or are consistent, but that's just the way it is. I also like number five, assuming that the recommendation to the town council is to explore uh, that as an option to get further guidance as to uh, how we move forward. Again, I think if the council didn't want to, uh, you know, expend a significant sum of money to get that professional consulting uh, direction that uh, we just have to interview Commissioner uh, Rodriguez a few more times to get the <laughs> guidance on how to do this. Um, so those are my thoughts on that. And, and I guess I want to also go back to Commissioner Caroline and see if you wanted to continue talking about some of the other thoughts you had that you mentioned. Thank you, Amy. Um, I think people are concerned about the character of the house, the character of the town changing. I'm not convinced that it's the size of the house that's changing the character of the town. It's, it's the property value is growing. Right now, an average cottage costs a million dollars, close to a million dollars. That's what's changing the character of the town. And it's, it's the demographics are changing. It's not the house sizes. So um, I'm really concerned about infringing on property rights. So I mean, I, I probably put Cindy. I number one is probably you know, but if the people seem to think that you know they want to change the, the house size, I would like. I, that's why I thought number two was a good. A good, um, a good way that we could give extra scrutiny as to why you would need that much sort of I mean, I was doing some quick calculations. I think Norma was asking, you know, really how big of a lot size you need. And I don't really think we really, I mean, I think the, the application that was here before us, I mean, I don't really think I was paying attention on how big 
house sizes are, but I think in general we don't normally, and from the, the, the survey that you had with the list of houses, I mean, we don't really have a lot of big houses here in Fairfax. So I think that the focus is on, in a different, is on something that really doesn't, um, doesn't really exist. Uh, further discussion or could I, could I add a, a comment to to what I earlier said? Uh, I, I really like what Laura just said because it's it's somewhat in keeping with my concerns. But I particularly like Michelle's suggestion if we're moving forward with a, a size limit. Uh, I like the way she has treated it by providing flexibility uh, if they bring in higher level green features and uh, allowing uh, existing larger homeowners to make improvements, which, which brings us back to the number four. Uh, so uh, if, if, we, if we need to make a change, uh, I think Michelle's comments somewhat incorporate uh, number two and number four to a significant extent. I also uh, heard Michelle, uh, and I think the part I liked the best of what she said was, if someone wants to, if we do limit the house size, and someone wants to build something a little larger, uh, that they be required to go through certain processes and make the house greener because obviously uh, you know Mr. Egger and, and others who were uh, desire um, some limits um, have it right that, that the bigger the house the more energy it is likely to use however I'm informed by contractors who I talk to that you can build a pretty large house today that would be more energy efficient than some of these old ones we have that are uninsulated that the walls have no insulation and there's no attic insulation. These older houses that are small can actually use way more energy than a you know mansion that's properly built. So I, I heard Michelle, I like that approach actually. I think that's a pretty good, a, a probably more complex than we were thinking about doing. But this is a complex issue. I also want to say something else. I did a little research into the issue brought up in the last meeting by some members of the public that there could possibly be a uh, you know, taking issue or something, and I don't think that's the case here. I think however we decide whether we limit it to um, some reasonable size or we don't place limits, obviously there's no difference, but there, the test for a taking would not be met here because we would have, um, first of all, an owner would still be able to use and sell their property somewhat. There's not a complete denial of economic value. Um, and there's a, this substantial advances test which has been debunked and then used by the U.S. Supreme Court more recently again. So it's kind of hard to know where the law is. And one of the things that in the book I read was, you know, a lawyer needs a glass, you know, a, a globe to tell what to predict what what is a taking, what a judge will think a taking is or not. I'm pretty sure this isn't. I'm ninety nine percent sure, but I would say go back to you know, go back to a town attorney to confirm it. The Chevron case, maybe you could mention to them and see what they think of that. But this is not one of these this is a substantial advancement of our of our town's uh, you know testimony proves that here. So of our town's um, community services, and there's a reason for limiting houses that isn't taken. So I don't think we're going to face that issue. I don't think that's even an issue. I think what we, what we have an issue of is, you know, how to go about this. Um, that's, that's the problem, and it's going to take, and I heard, you know, Reed and Ackerman and, uh, you know, Mr. Toy also said, you know, there's, it could, it could be, uh, September or October when we get to this ordinance and there's a final meeting. I don't think so. I think it's too complicated for that kind of thing. And, um, the statements that were made by town council members uh, 
definitely um, have to be taken into consideration, but I don't think that's all we have to take into consideration here. That's, that's where I'm at. Uh, and if I were to propose a limit, it would be about 3,500 feet. But I'm not even ready for that yet. So going back to the discussion of, you know, can, I, can I say one more thing? Because you I just, so. you just remember, <laughs> that the 120 square foot structure, one of them, that, that's what we're talking, one, not seven. And, and it has to be something that's not conditioned, is whatever that means, really, I think. That, that's, that was the idea, like a chicken coop or a storage shed, not a livable uh, 120 square foot. So going back to the discussion of, you know, having, you know, giving, um, allowing for changes to be made if they're green, we had the discussion previously that the reason some people wanted to do away with the, the points for the green building, for the green technology, is because the building code already has all of that in there. So, you know, I'm not sure that that kind of applies in, in this situation. I agree with Laura as far as the reasons, you know, the, the demographic may be changing and that may be generational and, and that, you know, probably changed when I moved here 40 years ago and the people that lived here then, long term, could have, you know, said the same thing. Um, and then going back to the May council meeting and listening to um, the discussion by the council when they were talking about things like um, owners of bigger houses need to make more trips out of town so that they can pay for their house. Um, smaller houses have less car trips. I mean, you know, we've discussed that before. None of that to me is relevant to the size of a house. My house is probably 900 square feet. The people around me have smaller houses, and they have help coming in, they have gardeners, they have to go to work, you know, they don't have big houses. Um, I think one council member made a comment about not wanting to have gates on houses, because I think that council member maybe felt that it, it you know, it didn't close that house and, and that um, those people from being a part of their neighborhood and their community. You know, we have limitations with, you know, the, the lot coverage, the setbacks. Um, the example tonight of the property we went through is we have the tools we need. Um, and I think it's, it's not, it's a solution looking for a problem that we don't have. And I think we need to be spending our time, frankly, on other things that we've talked about, like objective standards and those types of things that I think can help us and help our community more than dealing with this perceived issue. Oh, wow, are we going to let Commissioner Swift have the last word? No. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with that. Are you okay with that? Actually, I, I'd like to agree with everything Cindy said, but except the green code, because there are things, uh, there are green things that the state does not require. And I, I would like us to consider those. And I had already asked for a review of some of the codes. But otherwise, I, I agree, Cindy. So my recommendation would be. No change. It occurs to me that that could be part of a, a for like a better one, a beauty contest for larger homes, uh, consistent with Commissioner mm -hmm. Rodriguez, where mm -hmm. um, you know there's certain things, more recycled than. materials, for example. I mean, Fairfax could do it. Uh, it is a work Solar, program. Solar, rainwater. I'm suggesting not what was said. What I'm saying is that you have to show us quantitatively that the larger home is generating energy of a smaller home. That's not what the building code is going to require or does require. That's what I'm saying you've got to prove to us. Yes. Those numbers are different through installation of certain HVAC equipment and materials. So it's, a it's an energy calculation. Exactly. 
I wouldn't support that one. Okay, so I think, well, at the risk of putting words in the commissioner's mouth, there appears to be a general consensus to come up with the, the recommended option being along the lines of Commissioner Rodriguez's. Um, with the commission's consent, I would like to borrow her uh, to perhaps craft the recommendation, specific recommendation language. If you want to wait until the next month and review that once again, or we could, um, it's not going to go to the next town council meeting because when I get into my uh, director's comments, you'll see that we're pretty busy just preparing for that. I don't think you have consensus. I don't oh. think you want to represent that you have okay. consensus. I think uh, you have consensus that you don't have consensus. Um, I think that what you could be gearing up to do, and I will definitely volunteer Commissioner Rodriguez as much time of her time as you need. Um, but I think what you want to do is reflect to the council that there have been, there's a wide variety of thought on this from do nothing to uh, some pretty uh, significant changes to the ordinance. And, and when we do get to the point of sending something forward, you had on your staff report an attachment where you had some definitions. Um, when something does go forward to the council, I would want to make sure that there's every definition and explanation in there that helps them understand the zoning code. Um, things like an explanation of lot coverage and FAR and the different setbacks and with examples because you have people on the council, you have some that have never been on the planning commission, so they have no exposure there. You have some that haven't been on the planning commission for a while and may have, may not have all of that at their fingertips, um, so I need, I think we need to to educate them on the existing code. Yeah, and I, I'd just like to uh, offer one thing is that my intention with this, in describing consensus wasn't to uh, reflect that it was a unanimous opinion, but that there was a general direction. But uh, I, I understand, or I hope I understand uh, the chair's position, and certainly just looking at the comments about people looking at the different numbers and things like that. Yeah. There's, there's a wide variety of opinions. Because I think when you use the term consensus, it gives the impression that there's agreement in that body. So that's why I kind of objected to, to use it and brought that up. Because when I see consensus, to me that means everybody's in agreement. Um, and that isn't the case with us. Well, part of, part of the problem with this whole discussion is there's a lot of, um, we could use some hard and, fact, you know, hard and fast figures. There's a lot of speculation about how a large house uses more energy. But another thing that we're not taking into consideration here, and hasn't even been mentioned, I don't know what gentrification exactly means in the mind of the public, but, you know, there are, there are families with lots of kids who need a larger house. And so someone whose life, you know, is smaller, that's great. Some people can live in the tiny house that's on wheels. It's, you know, 600 square feet. Other people with kids and, you know, dogs and whatever they have, have a life too. And they need, uh, they need a little bit larger house. So, um, and then there's the person tonight with the 2,500 square foot house who lives alone. I think I wish her luck caring for it in the future, but, you know, all that Florida vacuum, I mean, it just, you know, just boggles my mind, unless they're going to have a maid. I'm also familiar, though, with, with another community where my son lives you know, in West Hollywood, and Beverly Hills, which is right next door, and 
Um, you know, there we might take a look at their anti-mansionization ordinance. So they also are sick and tired of people buying two or three lots and tearing down the three houses and building one large one. So there are ordinances there we could take a look at. We aren't LA, we aren't Nevada, we are Fairfax and we're going to keep it this way. Um, but we just, you know, other, other, other house size limiting ordinances are good clues for us. It wouldn't hurt to take a look at that. I haven't, but it would be a good idea. Um, so those are my comments. Any other thoughts from the commissioners before we tie up this item? procedural question for the director. And so, so the planning commission has authority to initiate the modification to whatever ordinance is appropriate, but it would seem like how, how is this going to be handled? Is it going to be pulled into the work plan discussion at the council level so they can decide priority or not doing it? Or how is this being handled? As you know, or may know, um, the consideration of the overall planning work program was once again continued at the last council meeting. Um, I have reason to believe that at the August 1 meeting they will indeed take it up. Uh, the the house, maximum house size effort is, is one of the uh, programs that we're working on this year. I mean, the fact that we're three meetings in county, um, it's going to go to the council. They're going to have a lot of people show up. They're going to have put their own perspective on it. So uh, it's 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 part of what will take a lot of staff resources, how it fits into the other priorities, and I appreciate uh, Commissioner Smith Swift's comment about what the bandwidth is for staff and this notion of objective development standards, which when I get into my comments I'll, I'll report on that as well. Um, and you know there's the wish you could do it and then there's the gotta do it and then there's the you know what you have left over for that, and, and it looks like things are changing rapidly, and we're getting into the God of Duty stage. So, it's it's there's all these different elements. Somehow, it's all going to come together. Hopefully, the council will provide good direction. But I think we're pretty much focusing on the God of Duty stuff. Okie dokie. So that leads us to your report. Briefly, briefly. Um, okay, the town council met last night, and I'm pleased to report that in the course of an exhaustive three and a half hour conversation, they made some very good progress um, on firming up their desires uh, and program parameters related to cannabis regulations. So um, it's due to go back to the council in August. Um, I don't know when it's going to come to the, the Planning Commission, but I can say that they made major strides in firming up things like what types of businesses as defined by the state, um, and even you know, retail numbers of establishments. Um, there's always going to be some interesting wrinkles, and I look forward to presenting that to the Commission when it uh, is turned over to your Commission for Development of Regulations. Um, that obviously is going to be a major work programs uh, item, and uh, we've been anticipating that. Um, other than that, the yes, I reported that Miranda Heights submittal just came in this week. Um, I'm going to try to get it posted on the internet, if not tomorrow, um, early next week, uh, so that people can eyeball what's changed. Uh, they still have 10 houses proposed. Um, the lower house that was noted in the planning status letter to the applicant back in March as not having adequate lot size to support that. That location is gone. So there's a new location for one of the houses. Uh, your commission is welcome to visit the site. We'll, we'll, we'll get that notice. I'm assuming if you sign up for a notification, which I, if you haven't, um, go to that particular web page, uh, fairfaxbuildingplan.org. Just sign up and we'll get that notice when it's changed. Um, we have a new intern in the planning office, a uh, young man who's in his third year at uh, University of Univers Oregon State. That's where his son's university. Um, the, the other university, the one that always 
Clark and moves away. University of Oregon, the ducks. He's a duck. He's a duck. He's not a meme. Um, <laughs> in any event, um, he seems like a, 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 a fine young man catching a lot of uh, uh, input um, and learning really quickly. He's already helping um, work on objective development standards. Uh, because the town council continued it once again, they, they promised that it would be the first uh, non-consent calendar item on August 1. But as your commission is aware, the, because of the outgrowth of uh, Heather me from the attorney's office, really start a discussion of what's going on at the state uh, in terms of housing regulations and the limitations on any local discretionary review and input on development. It's really incumbent on the town to start to put those together. And, uh, so we are uh, reaching out to various parties to try to figure out what information is available. Um, and that will likely, uh, assuming that we get council concurrence, that will uh, very likely be our highest priority. Uh, along with things like Miranda Heights, which of course we have to process, and the cannabis regulations, and maybe at some point finishing up on uh, maximum house size and things like that. So uh, look for the staff report for the council meeting and I will be reporting out the results of that meeting to your planning commission at the next uh, August planning commission meeting. Um, the last thing is, this is very preliminary, but the next um, planning commissioner's academy is going to be held down in Long Beach. Um, maybe they'd like to have the power on the entire conference, I don't know. But um, for, those, for those of us that stayed at that <laughs> hotel. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they get, what's that? Uh, Wounded heart or something like that for what you put up with. But in any event, that's in March of 2019. So if people are interested as we start to get into the registration period, I, I will let you know. Uh, and that's it. Uh, did, were you able to give us an update on Victory Village? And I also asked last month for an update on Caterpillar Academy. Um, so uh, those two items, uh, at the very least, I'd like to hear about them next month. Yes, Victory Village um, is in the building permit review process. Uh, so they have made the commitment that they are going to uh, construct, um, and they have submitted plans. Uh, the town hired an outside plan checker. Uh, because of the scope of this project and the timelines under which it has to be processed. Uh, so it's all hands on deck. Um, we are optimistic that we will meet the deadlines, which uh, there's something about December coming up in terms of uh, issuance of the permit or something like that. But uh, it's, it's gone from sort of the wish and hope to now it's just to buckle down and get through the, uh, the, the actual uh, um, review of the technical aspects of the, of the project, uh, including uh, finalization of the subdivision. Um, that, again, is kind of an internal ministerial uh, processing. So that's that's going forward. So um, part, of, part of the, part of the um, Victory Village discussion and the feedback we wanted um, was on the parkland requirement for the open space, where that is. Yes. The, as your commission is better aware than I, since I wasn't here, um, they did as part of their subdivision um, application portion of this project, divide what was formerly one parcel into three parcels. The hope, um, perhaps you could say intention at the time, um, was that the two additional parcels created um, would be uh, dedicated to open space. Uh, as is almost universally the case uh, with uh, affordable housing projects. They are pulling so many disparate funds and they are obligated to use prevailing wages, et cetera, that the bottom line is it ends up being a very expensive project and they're always up against it financially. And so the kind of the fallback option and the reason indeed why they did this subdivision in the first place was if they had to, these would be available for sale. And that's the option that they have to do at this time to get it to pencil out. So um, it would 
it's for one house on each nine acre parcel. Um, it's unfortunate that it won't be an uh, open space parcel, it, it would appear at this time. Um, but the vast majority of it will remain in open space. And there's still some discussion about possible uh, restriction or dedication uh, of at least the vast majority of the parcels to formal open space designation. But, and that's the part going back to um, beforehand, the idea initially was that they would sell those back. They would be divided into three parcels and they'd be selling the back two parcels anyway. So it still goes back to, you know, they're subdividing it. So what was the requirement to have some type of parkland dedication you know, perhaps at the top of the back property at the time of <clears throat> subdividing. Maybe I can clarify a, a little bit if I'm thinking along the same lines. There, there, there is a, um, there was a requirement for Victory Village that uh, they requested certain concessions. They were allowed certain concessions because they are a 100% affordable senior project. And they thus have a density bonus agreement with other concessions. I think height and parking were one of the... Uh, Two. There were both parking and uh, and there was an open space requirement within their development that is separate from the greater uh, open space dedication of the additional two parcels. So there, uh, there's a 7,000, 9,000 square foot open space, public space, requirement on the Victory Village site of development itself, which is different from uh, what we're talking about in terms of selling the, the other parcels. Yeah, so before the uh, RCD told us that they had jumped, you know, worked the numbers so that they could dedicate the 18 acres, before they said that, the proposal included uh, a strip of property around the back side that was potentially going to be like a trail to go through the back side, and that was going to be de dedicated as open space. That became That's obsolete. That's a part of the city bonus agreement. It became somewhat obsolete appearing when we believe that the 18 acres was going to be donated as open space. So the question now becomes, if the 18 acres is not donated open, as open space, we need to get back the open space dedication that was considered prior to, and I don't know because I'm not sure how it was incorporated into the final resolution. It was a part of the density bonus agreement that was signed, executed separately from the development and entitlement agreements. And, that I, and that's, that's what we'd like clarity on from staff. That's what I'm saying. They're two right. different things. I don't know. I thought they offered us the property for $300,000. They did. And we didn't buy it. So now we're that stuck with all this one. problem. We should have. That's what I said at the time. I said, you know, 300,000, get my Okay, but let's focus on where we are right now getting out of this meeting tonight as opposed to what it should have could us. So I would actually really like us to follow up next month with further information from staff about the status of Victory Village. And I would encourage you to include in that update any thoughts or conversations that you may have had with uh, town manager or others about you know 
what is the town going to do about those 18 acres? So that's part of what it is. Not only the dedication issue, but also can the town pursue those lands? I want to hear that. Also, uh, in regard to those 18 acres, uh, it's my understanding that the parcel above the site, above the Victory Village site, I don't know what direction that's in, um, is, is landlocked. And so I don't believe that the parcel is able to develop because they don't have street frontage that allows for water connections. Are you saying, saying that's not right? No, because the, our subdivision ordinance doesn't allow us to create a landlocked parcel. Mm -hmm. So they, they modified the lot so that it, it does, both lots have oh, access. Oh, okay, so they yeah. now have, I didn't realize that. Because we can't approve a lot Because I haven't seen the parcels, okay. Okay, so just to summarize, next month, if you could get back to us on more information about Victory Village, I'd like an update on the Caterpillar Academy, and I'd like an update on Mas Masa and their outdoor uh, apparent uh, not abiding by the restrictions on the outdoor music. Yes, okay. Okay, and, uh, and that's just based on, uh, you guys can watch Mark Bell's comments to the council last night when you get around to watching that meeting. Well, I thought he was talking about Harry's. So since we're kind of doing this back and forth with the planning director and the commissioner's request, um, any change on the floor space definition in relating to the ADU? Do we have? So I'm just asking because I'll be asking about updates on that. It appears that we will, rather than trying to wrestle the state's unique term into our own code, we just simply have when we're dealing with ADUs, we're going to call it floor space. It will be pretty coterminous with what floor area or square footage is. Um, so it's, it's going to be called floor space. We, we discussed that. Okay, so as long as, because I haven't looked at, I didn't look at the ADU that went to the council, I mean the ordinance, do we within that then say floor space because we're using, unless it's changed, it's written with using the state's language, so the, which brought up this whole issue. So the, it says floor space. So do, within that, do we say floor space equals this? Uh, no, because again, the state doesn't define it. So I think we're, we're generally, we're reduced to kind of using a general, generality, but in terms of- And not defining term, it. And not defining it. Now, as a practical matter, uh, the, Adoption of that will probably await the next round of state statute uh, approvals. Uh, there are, there's at least one, I don't know the number, but there's one that's going forward that will illuminate floor area ratio limits and I think lot coverage, um, but it would uh, allow, it would prevent the jurisdiction from limiting ADU size to less than 800 square feet. So, Read backwards, it means that theoretically a jurisdiction could adopt an 800 square foot limit. Oh yeah, they're not three yet. So, so, so in essence, the the draft and the changes aren't going to go. We're just going to sit on that until we see what the what comes through with the state, and we're going to go with the existing one we have. Well, that's what it appears like at this time. The, the the challenge is simply that there are so many regulation changes that. You know, you're never, okay. you would never right. get through the last one before you're facing the next one. Then my, my last one is, um, you know, part of our work plan, and I, and I think the sense that I have is that there was no council feeling that we couldn't do this. We should start, and it's volunteer labor, we should start the survey of the historical buildings downtown and get that project rolling um, and get that individual started with that, I don't think that affects, you know, per se, our work plan, at least to do the, the inventory. In the staff recommendations on the work programs to the council, uh, the 
historic evaluation component as described in the general plan and recommended by the commission is rolled into the objective development standards analysis and simply put, uh, what better way to define the downtown than to look at it from a historical perspective, um, and especially if we're trying to preserve that. Uh, that being said, one of the, the, the attractive aspects of pursuing that was that the planning commission and staff weren't going to have to do too much work because we had a ready-made expert who was volunteering to do that. So, um, I the nice thing is, is as of August 1, hopefully the council will take action and then we'll have a clear idea. Um, but I agree that there is some flexibility in uh, assuming that we're working on objective development standards. I anticipate that that would be something that staff will bring to the commission and be working on as we go into that focus on objective development standards. I brought that up last time. Look at the minutes. Uh, we need to step on the gas on the historical buildings. And there's a, there's a book for sale in town, History of Fairfax, that has a beautiful list of every single historical building. I was amazed to find out that the Thai restaurant used to be a bus station. And you can see the yeah, logic nice of it also. Nice so, store. so you know, we need to, I agree with this, we need to get that process going, and I think we could shortcut it pretty quickly. It shouldn't cost that much. Um, why not? Okay, I think I've lost control of my agenda here. Um, so, I think we're done with the planning director's report, and we're going to go to the minutes. Uh, does anybody have any comments on the minutes? I have two. Okay. Um, we should note in the minutes um, that we had a commissioner that left at the last meeting after um, I think the first agenda item, and, and we don't note it, note it, and we actually didn't make the announcement so that the person doing the minutes would understand that. So we have actions where we have that commissioner participating in the vote and then being absent the rest of the vote. Um, Can you I, help me so figure out where that goes? That um, we could stay on page seven. That, and I don't know how the way to phrase that, but that um, left at this time. Right, left after that first item. I asked to be excused. Did you put flat? I just walked out of the building. I did ask permission. She has okay, no we'll, we'll put that, we'll that permission here. My request to the end was granted by the chair. Does that sound okay? That, that's, that works. And then um, just on page five. My third, my comments, my third. Well, can, we, can we go back? Well, can we go back? I thought you guys said that was on page seven after item one. Yeah. That was item one. That right before, right before item two begins. Yeah. Okay. Are you? Thank you. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, so on page five, my comments. The third bullet there, she does not think that the number of people servicing the household, gardeners, cleaning people, et cetera, is related to house size. That's kind of a statement, kind of out there by itself, and it doesn't really get to where I was coming from on that. So, um, what I had said was I had listened again to some of the council members' reasoning for smaller house size, and I don't agree that bigger homes result in more car trips to maintain the houses like cleaning service and gardeners, nor do I agree that smaller houses create more neighborhood interactions. So it's just kind of a statement out there, but it doesn't show why I made that comment. Any other changes or comments? Uh, I have a couple here. 
Um, on page four, uh, second bullet under Jessica Green, uh, she actually said large homes do not go with the character of Fairfax. Uh, Liesel Blash is L-I-S-E-L. -E uh, when we get down to Richard Alpert, he is opposed to the proposal, not the petition. And uh, on page 13, uh, my friend Kelly's last name is Heike, H-E-I-K-K-A. -E okay, so any other changes on the minutes? Do we have a motion? Motion to approve as amended. Second. Also. Motion, Green, second, Fredoso. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstaining since I skipped out. Since yeah. you left. Okay. So, uh, Caroline abstaining, the rest in favor. And uh, Commissioner, comments and requests that haven't already been expressed. Just wondering um, whether there's some reality behind the idea of improving the parquet. I saw a discussion there, I just don't know where that's at. So it's more or less a question. I'm in favor of it, and um, maybe we can have a report on that next month. Well, the, the simple answer is there's not a lot of money. So I, 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 my, my understanding is that it, it's not going to consist of a lot of work. It's, I think there's an ADA and some pain. So, here. Well, so we're, not, we're not going for that. that yeah, that, I will confirm. We're not going for the lowering of it and having a two story deal with the pension. water catchment basin underneath. Mm -hmm. That's too bad. So, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Right. Second. I'll second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Let's go. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, staff. Thank you for supporting this wonderful democracy. And, and thank you, video guy. That was fun. Thank you.